What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Season Gaming Big Cast, episode 216. We are back. It is exciting to me to be back because we have all kinds of stuff to talk about. Way too much to talk about that we're going to be able to cover today, but we'll cover the big stuff as always, uh, along with uh, several other things that uh, you may not expect. I am your host, Ainsley Bowden, joined as usual by this illustrious panel. On my right, Mr. Seven himself, Mr. Rodriguez. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to yield my time uh, for, uh, for for Travis today. So uh, <laughs> good to time. see you. Good to see you. Dan's been watching Senate hearings all week. Yeah. He's yielding his time to the chair. Yeah, yep. he's yielding uh, right out of the gate. He's not wasting any right time, which is good. We don't yeah. have time to waste today. So That's right. uh, as always, host of Virtual Legality and Lawyers <laughs> and Dragons. You know him well, the Hogue himself, which, by the way, I think should be your alt account, the Hogue himself. Good morning, sir. Good morning, but this is the first I'm hearing of not having time to waste today because I thought that's what we did here. Pretty um, so I'm going to yeah. have to rethink my strategies, but I will also yield my time to the chair. Yes. <laughs> and uh, last but certainly not least, especially not today, is the disheveled, the half-broken, half-man himself, Mr. Ty Guy Travis, who is now engaged. <gasps> It's true. What? McClun Can I give a raspy McClunky? Is that <laughs> sure. a, a voice breaking McClunky? Yes, thank you. I uh, I proposed to my girlfriend yesterday in a uh, in a very elaborate uh, way that that involved me uh, organizing a far -reach reaching and vast conspiracy to trick her into marrying me. That was successful. <laughs> Unfortunately for her, I was too prepared, and uh, uh, she became foolish. weak. It's a she long time me. in the making, yeah. Yeah, it was a long time in the making. She yeah. she could not stand against it apparently, so it, uh, it worked. Um, it was yeah, surprises. Right. yeah, yeah, that's right. That's what I did. It would have been a lot easier if that's what I did. Actually, this was way more difficult. Uh, but yeah, it was a it was a a, a day to remember certainly. Um, that's fantastic, so. man. You come on, you got to give like a high level. I know you can't go into all okay. the details like we know, but you got to give a high level spiel because this is too yes. unique yeah. and interesting not to. Yeah. So Ains yeah. and Hogue and, and Dan are, learned a few uh, weeks ago, but I uh, proposed to my girlfriend by via a, uh, a extremely elaborate fantasy themed turn based RPG adventure that she did oh. not know about. Um, in basically. real life. Yeah. In real she, life. Uh, yeah. Not a game. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In real life. <laughs> yeah. You have to, that yeah. Like, that yeah, sounded like uh, you made her a game. <laughs> yeah, basically, basically she, she thought we were going on a walk through Golden Gate Park, which is a few blocks from my house. But as our walk began, as we entered the park, uh, a van screeched into uh, into view and a bunch of goblins came out and they kidnapped napped me. Old school style. Force. Yeah. Old school style. <laughs> they, threw oh, me, they, threw, they threw me in the panel van and, and, uh, and ran off into the woods. And then my friend, Nick, who was dressed like a bard, and had a mandolin uh, came to say that if she wanted to rescue me, she was going to have to go on a epic quest to save me. And it was uh, it had turn based mechanics and party members that she gained along the way and XP and leveling up and uh, loot a vendor and 50 plus cast members that played different NPCs and villains and bosses along the way in three acts throughout the entire city. Uh, starting in Golden Gate Park and then going through Presidio and then ending up downtown. And then, of course, the final boss battle was at Coit Tower where uh, she defeated the Necromancer who had obviously. kidnapped me. Yeah, obviously. And then uh, she went to the top of Coit Tower to rescue me where I proposed. It was a uh, nine-hour production. It cost me more money than I care to admit. <laughs> and, uh, and it was uh, extremely elaborate. But the great news is that after six months of planning this thing and doing secret rehearsals and meetings on Tuesday night that she didn't know about, it went off without a hitch. It could not have gone better. Like every part of it went, we had like a tavern fight. Uh, Cause my, sure. one of my fraternity brothers owns a Naturally. tavern and we, we obviously did turn that into a fantasy tavern fight and all these things came together in, in a really awesome way. And so it was a successful operation <laughs> and she now has to marry me, which, it sucks for her, trust me. <laughs> and I lost my voice. Oh, man. So, yeah. 
Anyway, right. good time. You're, a little, you're a little raspy, but it was well worth it. It sounds like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that's just how I did it too. Um, <laughs> I, I figured a little yeah. bit of copycatting there. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you got to draw inspiration from somewhere. Sure. sure. No, I was actually going to ask if this was inspired by uh, the famous PC video game Manhunter Two: San Francisco, which of course <laughs> yeah. ends famously with the battle on Coit Tower. Um, and yeah, I just didn't know. That was that was, of course, my inspiration. I, okay. I now I need to play that game. Apparently, <laughs> is it a turn-based game? Is it a turn-based RPG? Or uh, it's it's more it's actually a detective action adventure with battle mechanics that are turn-based. Um, okay. So you know you've got right, uh, well, there, you've got that you go. to look forward to. That yeah, I'll, I'll get to see where I stole from. That'll be good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, big Amazing. congrats, man. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, as Travis said, he told us about this many weeks ago. He's been playing this for a very long time, and uh, it was awesome to hear yesterday from him that it went off without a hitch. And now I can't even he, believe that. I no, figured I can't you'd be working through. I figured you'd be working through funny hitches uh, that would serve to uh, only only enhance the experience. Yeah, but I would never could've, believe could've you I, I, But honestly, I just I over prepared, and and I did this thing where like right after I got kidnapped, I was in what we called the advance group which sure. means that we we go to every place she's supposed to go about an hour before. And I had like the Nathan Fielder laptop strapped to my chest and was just like calling people and being like, you go there and then you go there and getting all the costumes together. And so like I would leave and then five <laughs> minutes later, the party would like arrive. And you know, we also, you would like this hug. We had a fast travel system that she unlocked after the end of the first act. <laughs> so there was, a guy, there was a guy called the Mysterious Rider who would pull up and his car was all like cobwebbed and he was dressed like the Grim Reaper. And then the, the party would get in and then he would drive them to their next spot. And as he did it, he would read them loading screen tips. He would be like, did you know that you can, you know, he would like do stuff like that as they went to the next location. Yeah, it was very stupid. So... Yeah, I'm, I'm not allowing my wife to watch this because I basically threw a I, ring at her and said, hey, you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, this is way better. Oh, man. Anyway, it was hilarious. It was very, I, very It fun. sounded, I'm, I'm I'm sorry I couldn't have been in San Francisco yesterday by the sound. I did, hey, for the record, I did invite these three. I was like, you hey, did? if for some reason you could make it, I would absolutely write parts for you. Yep. Um, you yeah, You would have made a great wizard. Hug. That's all I have to say. Uh, by, by the way, uh, Elu asks, I want to see this documentary. And in fact, Travis did have someone recording this. Uh, whether or not right. we will see the entire thing or not, you can let us know. Yeah. I mean, he literally recorded the entire thing. I had one of the video people at IGN uh, come and he was a squire with a camera strapped to him and he followed the party the entire time. So a lot of it is documented and maybe I'll put together a sizzle reel or something. But uh, that's I can't think about that right now, dude. I just want to sleep. I'm, I'm <laughs> which is yeah. why we're starting our two-hour show now yes yeah, exactly right. 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 That's right well sir uh congrats welcome you became a little more seasoned yesterday and uh you're now you're now part of this uh this this crew on a level i've got nothing here uh, i tried to take that somewhere and didn't know where tried, to, to, tried to connect yeah. it all and it just yeah, yeah i got nothing it fell apart <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, like good luck Good luck. <laughs> Godspeed. <laughs> we should be saying good luck to her. Uh, I will reach out and personally, you know, and say good luck and Godspeed, and uh, yeah, take care of our boy for us. Yeah, you don't need to tell. <laughs> you don't need us to tell you. It's a continuing adventure in both directions. Uh, so yeah. you know, congratulations, Travis. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So you having kids uh, soon? Or? Yeah. Nope. Wow, never. right, yeah. right in like we are never parents. having kids. Mark my words, it's not gonna happen. You heard I'm it here first. Dog. I'm getting yeah. snipped right after this episode. So, yeah. Dude, it's the best. All it's right, best. <laughs> no, not for me. I'm sure it's the best for a lot of people. No, 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 no. I mean, I'm mean getting snipped. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I know that. I believe that. I believe yeah. it's the best. Yeah, yeah for sure. We hold I wish I would have down that path. You know? through it. Can you be my partner? <laughs> yeah. Live my dream, Travis. Live my dream. <laughs> <laughs> Getting snipped earlier in life is your dream. Is that what it is? <laughs> and we're back off the rails. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone. All right. All right. <clears throat> so we've got a uh, we're gonna have a fun show today, obviously, beside be beyond what we've already uh, joked about. Um, so we're coming back. We've got a lot of news to cover, but uh, we obviously can't cover all of it because there's been Gamescom, there's been false acquisition rumors, there's been announcements, there's been games, there's been all kinds of a price hike that we're going to talk about, which we were, you know, two weeks removed from being completely wrong about. Um, uh, not that I think, uh, you know, I think nearly everyone was wrong about that, but we'll see. 
We're going to talk about that as well. And then joining us uh, a little later is going to be a uh, former executive producer at Bioware, Mark Dara, who uh, is going to join us to talk about uh, Dragon Age, Anthem, EA, and kind of everything involved with that. So funny enough, I started the conversation with him about Anthem. Um, and that's how him and I got talking. So uh, quite funny because oh, we've as- been tricked. It's going to be 60 minutes of Anthem. Hey, yep. hey, we're, we we would be so lucky. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> be like, Let, let's go through all the games in alphabetical order. Where does that put it? Uh, Anthem. We'll start let's, there. Yeah, might as well start yeah. there. Um, <clears throat> so, well, of course, uh, we have to have a 45 minute dialectic on Saints Row, obviously, right? No. Oof, oof. No, I don't. Oof. No. I haven't but, played it, so I can't comment. You're right. uh, I bought it. the game. I need currently to play playing it. Saints Row. Okay, you're all right. Mad? So, I we I mean I, I can. I saw the reviews come out. I was on vacation. I think people knew this, um, and I said that's interesting. Um, and I I knew I was going to get it because there's really nothing else I want for the rest of the year. So I was like, all right, well we'll give this a shot. I like Volition for a long time. I'm one of the six people that will vouch for Agents of Mayhem. Um, and so How dare you say that right before Splatoon comes out, by the way. Nothing you want to uh, I, well, Splatoon 3, I already bought two months ago. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we can talk about semantics, it's already ready. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I would say that it, I, I haven't experienced the bugs that people have complained about. Okay. Um, so, it's very hard to adjudge that. It's clearly what I would describe as junkier um, than what folks might otherwise be used to it's not going to you're not going to be confused about it for any kind of sony you know first party game or or microsoft's first party game i'm i'm agnostic on that uh but i don't know it's saints row like i i I feel like reviewers shifted more than the game did and it's always an interesting point of comparison uh because i i'm actually surprised how saints rowy it is uh based on what of our, our earlier conversations were uh and <clears throat> I don't. I don't know what you were expecting. I. I, I feel like. I, I feel like that. That. Uh, that meme, of like Job from Arrested Development looking in it, or or not Job, uh, but uh, the other guy, the main guy, uh, looking in and it's at the bag. It says Dead Dove, and he says, "I don't know what I was expecting." Oh yeah. Like, hey, you put it in Saints Row, Mike, Michael. Yeah. Michael. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I. I don't know. I. I'm getting the fun I would have expected out of it. Cool. Interesting. Okay, that makes me a little bit more interested. I, I think it's like it. a. I think it's like a seven, and I think if you're hit with with bugs off off of that, then you're probably knocking it down pretty significantly. I I haven't I haven't really experienced any significant bugs. I mean, there's you know there's open world bugs. Yeah, but, I just um, gave it a six, and I was like, yo. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. And that's that's one of the ones that raised you know my eyebrows because IGN. It's a fairly generous review source, I would say, on a lot of the big releases. Not when I'm doing the reviews. (laughs) Right, okay. All right, Travis. They're not giving you a lot of the big releases. Uh, (laughs) um, But so that that was actually a little bit of a surprise to me. It's doing what it says. But I I, I like that standard um, building the Empire plot line. You know, I like that in the Mafias. I like that in the Saints Row 1 and 2. Um, So it's, it's just redoing Saints Row. Yes, I would have rather them done time travel and multidimensional hijinks with whatever their current crew was back in the day. Uh, but it's a seven to me. Okay. okay. It's funny. We've talked about the bug thing before, right? Because we, when we talk about cyberpunk, obviously, we always seem to go back to that one. But it's the same thing. It's like you can only talk about your experience, right? Travis and I talk about that a lot. It's like if I didn't experience these things, how am I supposed to? How would that impact my review? You know what I mean? So if, if you're enjoying yourself and you're not experiencing uh, some of the bugs we've seen online or people have reported them, by all means, yeah, that's good to hear. I, no, I mean, I think it's perfectly, I, you know, wait <laughs> wait for sale if you're not otherwise into it. But it's like, uh, it doesn't look like a game that should be hammered from my experience so far. Gotcha. Obviously, if it bricks my Xbox tomorrow, I'll feel differently about it. <laughs> yeah. Jay, Jayhawk says, Hogue, take a look at the voice acting cast from the first Saints Row and compare it to the new one. I'm not sure what he's referencing there. Uh, so, Jayhawk, know. you can expound upon that if you'd like to. Yeah. I'm a um, happy go lucky cowboy. I wear a Route 66 <laughs> shirt and a cowboy hat. How I always pictured you. Uh, Yep. I will also yeah. say I don't I don't think it's getting hammered really. I think it's Metacritic is like in the 60s and it's sort of in that okay to good space is what I call the six to sevens. But I think people just expect more from like this, you know, 
triple a or you know big big title anticipated release and so it's sort of well, if you look at the saints but, rows if you look at the saints yeah. rows they're in like the the low mid 80s and like i don't feel a distinction um got and it. i think i think that it got hit a little harder for what i always don't love which is like lack of evolution um mm -hmm. and it's like well the gun plays a little bit better it's a little bit faster they have some ideas with some of the things they're doing with the fighting that i like um, but it is very much my feeling while I was playing this was, oh, they don't make them like this anymore. Um, and it's like, I think that bugs people sometimes. Whereas if you're, if you're me, it's like, ah, I don't make it like this anymore. It's a, it's a positive. Um, you know, I yeah. want Final Fantasy to be turn-based, you know, I am what I am. Yeah. I, I do yeah. think, you know, the industry evolves and sometimes <laughs> that means when you play something that feels like it was made in a different decade, it could be like, oh, this feels a little behind the times. I get that. I don't think evolution is always a positive or the only direction things can go. So I, you know, I'd like real time strategy games back, turn based RPGs, uh, things like this. Saints Row, I've enjoyed it. It's um, uh, it's also a thing that uh, Travis and I were talking about offline too, which is um, the tendency for audiences or the community or however you want to word it to think that if a game is anything below a seven, it's not worth playing, and that's just fundamentally not true. And I think that if we're going to be honest about the kind of one to 10 scale that reviewers are supposed to be using all of, which uh, I would compliment Travis, he does well. Um, it, it's, you know, because a game gets a, a six and a half on average, it doesn't mean it's a terrible game. Um, and I think we really need to fight against that kind of uh, that group think that occurs uh, on Twitter, you know, which again represents a very minute percentage of the gaming community, but still that, that group think does occur where it's like, we had high expectations for this game. Wait, it's not an eight. It's garbage. And it's like, well, no, that there's there's a lot of gray area there you left out. <clears throat> well, I like yeah. it. I don't want to spend too, you know too much time on it. It's it is Saints Row again. Uh, and if people are having bug problems, it's interesting. You know, that's gonna be worse. Cool. Are you uh are we in? What are we playing? Is that what we're doing right now? Yeah, let me get to the couple of these super chats real quick. Okay. Though. Uh, so, Fat Boy, I'm gonna. I know you're here, brother. I'm gonna save your super chat because it's a question directly for Mark. So we'll we'll I'll, I will ask him that when he's on. Let's save that one for now. Uh, and then Dan, let's hit these other ones up. Tao yeah, in the house. Tao with the twenty dollars super chat. Thanks, man. Sup, uh, chat. Sup, Bitcasters. Have a great show. So we doing the Anthem podcast, right? Yes, this is <laughs> all they, them, all they, the don't, they don't know it yet, uh, but that's yeah, where we're yeah. headed, Tal. You, that is look, where we're headed. If you look in the background of Ains's uh, set today, I think you'll see maybe yeah. that is the case. Yeah, We've got Dragon Age Origins and Jade Empire. I uh, think they're in order of ascending there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't want to say it. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Tal. Really appreciate you. Pomp in the house. Yeah, there you go, man. That's the perfect game. LOL. Congrats, Travis. <laughs> Yeah, I, IGN 10 out of 10. I, maybe? I don't know. And some balance go. issues, let's just say. That's some balance issues. The main characters got very powerful, but, you know, we, we got through it. <laughs> we, should, we should have IGN review Travis's proposal. Yeah. Who would we review do it? it? I guess my girlfriend would be the reviewer. She would yeah. have to. Oh, this is I perfect. I call her my yeah. fiance now. You could sell enough. this, man. Yeah. You could pay for some yeah. of the wedding. I love it. I like you where go. your head's at, Hug. He's always <laughs> like... He's like always it. thinking of the way to return, yeah. yep. Yeah. Uh, Pompa, thank you, sir. Gecko Gamer in the house. Yeah, man. If Game Tom, if Game Tom gets mentioned, I just want to say that I had a good time and there will uh, there while my journey to and from it was a uh, near disaster. Uh oh. Yeah. That's not yeah. good. Travel's uh, fun right now, isn't nice. it? Yeah, travel is yeah. a mess right now. Hopefully everything's okay. Glad you had a good time there. We are going to talk about Gamescom here shortly. Like I said, we, uh, we've we got a lot to cover in a short period of time today. So uh, yeah. we'll catch up. We'll catch up. Um, appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. And yes, we are on currently playing. We're keeping it uh, anything new or interesting. Because I know, funny enough, Travis and I are actually reviewing the same game right now um, that we can't talk about yet. So... That doesn't do anything for us. But Travis, did you have something else? Are you else it too? Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. 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 So um, did you have something else you wanted to mention? Oh, my review's done. I, I yeah. It'll be live when no, they not, let me not about that no, game. You about had, any you other had, game. Were, yeah. You asked we were just playing. Uh, it sounded like you had something you wanted to say. About Correct. It. Oh. <laughs> 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 we're not, we're not okay. going to put you on the spot. I, uh... <laughs> 
I don't. Okay. Well, I did some Gamescom coverage. I can talk about that. Uh, we'll get to that. We had a, yeah, we had an exclusive. I I re- uh, previewed last week for uh, a park builder. I don't know if any of you guys are into like like theme park simulators. You know? Okay. Who wouldn't be? Yeah. Yeah. Those games are sweet. Uh, that are that I previewed. Yeah. This one's called Park Beyond. I don't know if you guys saw the reveal at Gamescom, the announcement, but it's basically like a theme park simulator where you can make the rides do things that are physically not possible in real life uh it's called uh-huh. impossification so you can build like a regular park and then you can spend the joy that your uh attendees generate by being in your park as like a resource to impossify certain rides and then a lot of them have multiple levels of impossification so they'll go you know they'll get even crazier and so like uh you know, they had like, you know, that ship that, that the, 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 the pirate ship that's in theme parks. And then oh, yeah. Impossible. Yeah. When, when you impossify it, instead of doing this, it like cracks like the Titanic into a bunch of different parts as it's swinging. And then each of the parts goes like different ways and stuff like that. And like chaotic. And it's kind of fun because you get to just build like a, 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 just an untethered from reality theme park. So mm. I did a preview on that. That was pretty fun. And, the other stuff I'm ta- I, I'm playing is, is sort of like what you said, uh, Ains. I guess I'm not allowed to talk about it. So, okay. um, yeah, I got I got some reviews coming out. So, all right, all right, yeah. Dan. Oh, when I'm playing Destiny, I guess I need to talk about that because Destiny got some stuff this week at Gamescom. So, it did. were you it did, hoping Michael. I would forget, Ains? Were you? No, 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 no. You reminded me. So, my stepson, I've told many times, right? Huge Destiny guy. So, we're on vacation this week. We're away. And I'm, I'm your stepson, I'm... right? <laughs> uh no um <clears throat> yeah i can't take that i can't handle that level of responsibility man that's a lot <laughs> um <laughs> but he was you gotta pay about for a wedding and all that stuff it's not yeah, no, yeah no i'm sure. good um those days are behind me um but as you know obviously and i know most people know the expansions are free to play uh this week in destiny so i got home i was like oh i can finally play witch queen so we joke all the time on the show about people returning to destiny and how much of a struggle it is if you don't know what the heck's going on right so here's a perfect example of how bizarre return it can be for returning players to destiny i t- reinstall the game i haven't yeah. played it since last year so yeah. at least a year pre witch queen pre oh well before witch queen yeah okay. so turn it on i get a cinematic right away yes. um it's an opening cinematic. I have no idea what's going on or who these characters are, right? Which one is it? I'm really... It, so it ended up being with the Witch Queen one, which I didn't know at the time, right? So it starts, and then it immediately goes to the first mission of Witch Queen. Witch Queen, yeah. why can't I say that? And I'm like, well, I don't want to start this yet. I want to go to the tower and reacclimate Uh-oh. myself to the game, right? Uh-oh. So I don't start the mission. I'm like, something... And then something came up in the house. I was like, all right, I'll come back to this, right? So turn the game off. Come back, turn the game on. I get a different cinematic. Sure. Seasonal. Something else entirely different with different characters. And I'm like, and then it tries to start a new mission somewhere yep. else on some other Europa, I guess, or somewhere. Yep. And Seasonal I'm like, activity. yeah. I'm like, what is this? Like, where am I now? And who am I talking to? If you so, do it right, you can get the Mars opening again from the original <laughs> Destiny 1. So yeah. You, have, you just keep turning it on. And I was uh-huh. like, why? turning it on two different times would i get two different cinematics and two different missions like that that nobody should have ever coded that anywhere that should not happen it actually (laughs) happens a lot in live service games because you'll get the expansion uh thing and then the next time you log on you'll get the seasonal thing and that's exactly what happened to you you got like the cinematic for the thing that happened that expansion, and then when you logged on again it was like all right now we need to introduce them to the season and the story (laughs) but there but there's no preface like it just know, goes it, into the cinematic. That's like, like Fortnite does that too. Like it'll give you like the <laughs> Fortnite. Like, Fortnite's a BR. I, but Fortnite's a BR. Fortnite's a BR. Come on, I can but jump into Fortnite the and they I'm do sorry. cinematics. Yeah. Are you not invested deeply in the Rock's foundation and whether or not he's going to fight off the multi-dimensional invaders? I'm yeah. sorry, what? <laughs> oh, gosh, some people. And, and, and Tal said, "Stop." Division two does not do that. Well, that's because Division yeah. 2 is a better game, but we can move on for that conversation. Oh, does Division 2 ha- still have support? <laughs> oh, I don't know. boy. Yeah, Division 2 is, is not a game anymore, I don't think. I think what? Yes, that. it is. They're, they're still, still doing season They're still four. updating it, yeah. They're still I don't know. Uh, you have to tell, tell you something. My, my son is like Travis. Very, very destiny. Like, just like your son. Yeah, the, the, he came home that day from work. He's like, I got to tell you all about it. About five <laughs> minutes in, I had drool running down my mouth. 
I was falling asleep. <laughs> I was like, I don't understand what's happening. Like, like, but was that specific to, to Destiny, Dan? <laughs> yes, I, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 I, 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 I couldn't figure it out. Like, it was light ball and all of a sudden, like, there's so much. And he's like, oh no, onboarding is going to be much better down the line with with light ball because they're introducing all this other stuff. I'm like, they I are know, actually. I know they, they are. are. I, then he told was, me about that was them. one of the Board that was rule. one of the big announcements was that they're actually coming out with like a. So you like want to play the social stuff quest line yeah. it's like a so you want to do, do destiny well here's 12 steps to like you know set right. up your account you know and you have to do those like guided nice. set up your accounts finish all the steps they, they're adding one of those so nine years later this is their, this is their them. fourth attempt it is way too it is way too long but you know they, they got it we're, we're, they, did, uh, we're, they did first like two different ways i mean they, they've they've given this a run yeah they've uh they're playing with live ammo here. This is sort of uncharted territory. There's not a lot of games <laughs> like Destiny. And That's so, fair. You know, they're, That's true. They're they're, figuring, they figure it out as they out. go. Yeah. Exactly. And a lot of times they get it right, and a lot of times they get it wrong. But no matter what, the industry learns and gets better for it. So, Well, the biggest celebrate. news, of course, was screw you, Vault. That's right. Yeah, that, the, it was. For me, that was legitimately, on the last word we talked about it, what was your favorite announcement? And everybody was like, oh, my God, I'm so excited for this gun and this class. And I was just like... <laughs> I'm excited that they're not destroying live service foundationally. And everybody was like, wow, Travis is boring. So, uh, which <laughs> fair enough. Um, but yeah, yeah that, that was, was the most for, important by far to me. For me, it was the most important announcement, which is that they announced they're uh, no longer going to be putting into the vault any of the uh, campaign content. They'll still be doing it for seasonal, which I think is a status quo for, for um, live service games. But they're not going to be doing it for paid expansions, you know, which is crazy that they did it to begin with. Hogue, as you pointed out, and I talked about a little bit on the last word as well. This does, of course, mean that they were, in fact, full of shit when they said that there was a technical issue. <laughs> That's that the first thing I tweeted. It. The first yeah, I, I, I said, I got a whole lot of crap from it's impossible to do this thing and we have yeah. to make it logistically feasible. Screw you all. Yeah. My theory is that well. they, uh, <laughs> they, they, they looked at the feasibility of doing it and thought, wow, we would have to staff up and invest in a whole bunch of technology I, and do all this other stuff. We want to make it happen. And they were like, oh, it's just easier to cut it. And then let's see if there's any backlash. And I think this is a, an example of when backlash can be a positive thing because there was a lot of backlash to this and it caused them to change their tune. And I think we just avoided a very bad precedent in the live service industry. And and Bungie reversing on this issue means that it is way less likely for this to become a common practice. And that is a huge win for gamers in the industry. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think that they were bending the truth a little bit there when they said it's you know not possible. Not possible maybe unless you spend money, but you should. You should spend money. Like that's the, you know, and I, I think now that they're staffed. That's your job. This is the not my problem argument, right? Exactly. This is, yeah. Because that's what it leans into. It's like, oh, you mean that it would be costly. That's not my problem. Yeah. That you're I mean, running this you theme park. Run this, run this theme park. Well, I was just going to say technical issue. It depends how you define it. Because, yeah, it, it can present technical issues. It doesn't mean those technical issues are unsolvable. It means they yeah. didn't want to solve for them. So, the, yeah. you know, by them saying there's technical issues preventing this. Well, that could be true. But it doesn't mean they're unsolvable technically. It, it's the uh, it's the backwards compatibility can't happen. Argument, yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, that happened yeah. a couple of years ago, and then they were yeah, like, yeah. "Oh, well, it can happen. We just had to try really hard." And I was like, "That's yeah, like, just had to get that the right engineer. Aren't you guys a technology yeah. company? Like, what what is what's going on here?" Yeah, so it'd be awesome well, now, if we had like somebody we could actually talk to about this in thirty minutes that would have some insight <laughs> into this, the background of this. Thing. Anthem didn't suffer from this though, so it's not going to be on the Anthem plate. Never got the chance. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> No, no, no I think, I, but in Destiny, if I'm, uh, and I didn't see all of the like the video and things like this, but Forsaken fans' hardest hit, right? Like it's not coming back. I, I, okay, I so things are turning, did they? Um, things are not returning, but Hogue, we should probably have a conversation about this at some point because there's a very interesting tidbit here, which is that uh, I guess I guess I'll just give you the summary. H Hogue, did you oh. just ask Travis another Destiny question, man? Yeah, yeah well, I miss Forsaken. Uh, it's my favorite part of Destiny. So good. there is a um, there have been comments that uh, uh, Activision owns the character Cade Six, and because uh, because um, what was the what was the company that your brother worked for? Well, my brother worked for the High one that Moon used Studios to help. at Activision. High Moon Studios High Moon. made Forsaken. Give exactly, or take. and because. <laughs> Because High Moon Studios made the two expansions that got vaulted in Activision Company, apparently there's some. We we should talk about this online because it's super complicated. But I I was talking to some people 
uh, that that are in the know on this. And apparently there is some legal concern about who owns what expansions and paying royalties. And so that's part of the reason that those two expansions specifically got vaulted and probably for legal reasons and expense reasons can't be. I was going to say, it's not legal reasons as much. I, yeah. I can't believe it's expense that reasons, right? It's, ro it's royalty shit. It's yeah, royalty money. Yeah, so money. All right. Anyway. Well, that's pretty interesting, interesting I, stuff. So, yeah. All right. Well, forsaken. I, I would be very surprised if those two are coming back unless something major changes, like if the Xbox acquisition of Activision comes through and then maybe Xbox is a little bit nicer about that or gives it to them or whatever, like they did Banjo-Kazooie to Nintendo, something like that. I don't know about nicer, happen. but they might try to use it to woo onto Game Pass again. There you go. <laughs> Good luck with that one. I don't think, I think that ship has sailed. So yeah, we'll yeah. They're supposedly a fully independent uh, subsidiary. So we'll we'll see how independent they are if they show up on yeah, Game Pass. Yeah, come on, come on, Hoke. We know why that company got acquired. We we know why that game got off of Game Pass the second the acquisition was announced. I think we know exactly. I'm just saying, you want some proof of independence? It'll be the yeah. Bungie announcement that they're putting Destiny on Game Pass. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, anyway, that's guys, it for Destiny. I talked enough. Yeah. Thank goodness. Whew. I'm very excited. Full section cool in comment. less than thirty minutes, Ains. We're sure. doing great. Well, yeah, the only because I know what the next two topics are, and this one is gonna is a funny one as it is. So, a couple weeks ago on BitCast, we had someone in our chat, and I, honestly, I forget who it was. So, if it was you and you're here, please speak up. Someone posted and said, "There's rumors that PlayStation is or Sony's going to increase the price of the PlayStation 5. and all of us definitively said, "Not going to happen." Like, it's did just, I? I don't remember that. Not yeah, going to happen. I, I would. I would it's, have, yeah, for sure. It's a console space. It's two years into the life cycle. We know of, obviously, everything going on in the world of manufacturing, inflation, and all these other factors that are impacting companies, but console space is different, blah, 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 blah. I won't go back into it. Um, well, guess what? We were wrong. So Now, hold on. Yes, okay. The news is they raise their prices. But in terms of us being wrong, it is entirely impossible to predict irrational and terrible decisions. So when we <laughs> predict our decision making, we're assuming rationality and someone that's looking out for the best interest of their shareholders, their company and themselves, not acting irrationally. So and we're going to hear yeah. the defenses of this again. It's not my problem, but our predictions were based on good decision making. I, I think we were on very firm ground when we talked about that. Uh it is interesting. So uh, the, not raising in the U.S., just the quick details. If you obviously I think everyone's heard of this, but it's raising in Europe, the U.K., Japan, China, Australia, Mexico and Canada. So pretty it's much all, care about. Yeah, all of care your about major the markets except the U.S. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know, guys, I, I this is a weird one to me. I, I did not obviously foresee this coming. Uh, I tried, maybe you guys can answer this or someone in the chat, and I haven't looked this up, but I was trying to remember a time when uh, in the last four decades or whatever the console market has been where, uh, uh, you know, a major manufacturer has increased the price multiple years into the lifespan in major markets like this. We know there's been some some little ones like Series S, I think, went up in India, someone said, and a couple ones like that, uh, you know, over the years. But uh, this well, is a broad changes. So, I mean, like people fight, well, of this, course, right? People fight uh, on this and say, well, it's it's really the currency. It's really the strength of the dollar against the other currencies. And I think there is some of that currency stuff happening, sure. there, but not in the way that is actually presented. First of all, it's not what Sony claimed uh, in their press release. They talk about supply chain issues. They talk about inflation. Um, and I, I think you're, you're going to be able to find instances where currencies went wild and prices of things changed just to reflect those, either entirely or partially. Um, this, this kind of broad global change in price, with the exception of our biggest market, so there you go, um, yep. is interesting. Uh, but I, I honestly think it's just bottom line stuff. I think if you're Sony, you're looking at this, you've had the supply constraints, you've not been able to actually fill the shelves a PlayStation fives and you say, well, screw it. Let's go get some of that scalper money because we're not filling in anyway. Um, and let's just go take advantage of the fact that people are still interested in the product and they haven't been able to get it for two years. And so we'll yep. raise the prices in these places. And yeah, currency plays a part and what they said plays a part, but it's still stupid. I mean, Sony and PlayStation video gaming, this yes. podcast, this video is all the tippy tip top 
of leisure, non-survival needs activities, right? <laughs> this isn't shelter. This isn't food. This isn't water. This isn't electricity. This is video games. And I love them to death, all right? They make my days happy. But Sony going out there, Oculus, Meta going out there, and raising prices in an inflationary environment where you've got things like freaking food increasing 15% annually – is the stupidest possible thing that you can do. And yes, people are going to come in and say they're, well, they're, they're taking losses because their prices went up and their shipping went up and their manufacturing went up. You, I, that's fine. But this to me is going to kill more goodwill and more brand recognition and everything that you've built for 25 years than anything else you could have possibly done. And I said, I tweeted out when this was announced. If I'm Microsoft, I drop my prices 10% and I make a marketing campaign going through the holiday on this period. That's yeah. what I would do because I, if I'm Microsoft, I don't care about selling you boxes and I don't care about the profits they make anyway because I changed my model. But this is I, people come onto my channel and say, you know, I'm a Microsoft shill. That's, frankly, I don't play anything on my Microsoft box except for Elder Scrolls Online right now. <laughs> um, and I play games on the PlayStation, but they have done so much to irritate me and to put their goodwill in a bad light now for a year plus. That I think that they are they're, they're penny pinching, their bean counting is going to hurt them in the medium to long term at this point. And this is the latest in that particular uh, deluge, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think well said. And I think that the question I asked when we were having a conversation on Discord about this, and I saw Travis just made the same point uh, uh, in the chat, is that the question I would ask back, right, to people uh, talking about this is, uh, if if Sony is in a different position in those markets, right, and they don't feel that they have that dominant presence and brand loyalty that we know they do have, do they make the same decision? And I think the answer is no. I think they, they make this decision because they know that the demand is high. They have the brand loyalty in these markets and they can take that hit. Whether or not that's true, you know. That's another question. But I think the whole reason people are saying, why didn't they do it in the U.S.? I think a, a, a number of factors. Competitor. Yeah, a number of they factors. But primarily, yeah. it's that Xbox is a big competitor in the U.S. where they're not as big of a competitor in some of these other markets. Yeah, so um, anytime there's a uh, there's a fanboy talking about how, you know, this brand or that brand is going to die in the games industry, and then somebody makes the point, oh, competition is good. I think this is a fantastic historical data set for why... Uh, <laughs> why competition is good i mean there's a million of those but if you really need a solid example uh getting the price increased 50 dollars doesn't happen in markets where there's actually healthy competition uh like the united states and uh it would be nice if there was more competition i would argue yeah the, and i don't know if you guys saw this was uh again kind of anecdotally but um there's i know a few people were reporting on that the the conversation in Japan shifted pretty quickly because uh, apparently a, a lot of the community already can't because of demand, right? They can't, or supply, excuse me, they can't get a PS5. And with Final Fantasy 16 being exclusive to the PS5 and now the price increasing, uh, a lot of upset people out there. It seems like anyway. Uh, so yeah, I, you know what? <laughs> Actually, buying an exclusive on one of the major brands in your country and then increasing your price in your home country where you're headquartered and not in the US. I'm telling you, like to me, there is a growing resentment towards this brand, and a I have the 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 in my back of my head notion of saying f you to this BS. I, they didn't increase my prices. I have a PlayStation Five sitting under my TV, but yeah. like this is not the only time they have made the financial bean counting pick and not explained themselves very well. I mean, that blog post is bullshit. Yeah, that blog post it, is crap. I, I've got it, it right really here. Is. It's it it's, really yeah. Is. It's a single paragraph generic statement um with no sense of uh kind of well it's jim ryan but no, se <laughs> no, no sense, sense of anything just, yeah. there's no human factor to it you know it sounds like you're you're reading an ai response to why something was done do you know what i mean it, wait wait i like that now i'm interested yeah. <laughs> He's got me <laughs> yeah it's uh it's i've I'd, never met jim ryan he could be an ai yeah. Um, that would be so yeah, I don't cool. know. Guys. It'd be like the end of Fallout. Uh, Fallout Three. Yeah. Yeah. It just turns out it's a computer the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> the whole president. time. Uh, I think it was Jayhawk or someone else said, "Yeah, it was a decision made on a spreadsheet." And yeah, and to Hoag's point, that's what it feels like. And and you know, despite the brand, it loyalty, also does not help this whole 
word in the air about PlayStation being a monopoly in certain markets. If you, yeah, just that's, such that's the right idea. answer, by the way. I keep getting yeah. people that ask me, well, does it, does this help them fight Activision because they had to raise their prices or ever, anything like this? Like, no, this is the opposite. If anything, they run the risk of showing that they are a monopolist in various of these territories because the way that you check for these things, and this is all antitrust stuff, we won't go too deep into it, but the way you check for monopolies is because we can't see into the multiverse, we're not Doctor Strange, you go and you see, hey, if you increase your price by what is supposed to be a material amount, but not a ton, like, oh, I don't know, 10%, 50 bucks on your hardware, can you expect any reduction in demand? Um, if no, then your market power is so strong that we will start to consider you a monopolist. And then that's not necessarily illegal, depending on various jurisdictions. But when you do things within those jurisdictions, like raise those prices, we might look at you askance. And Sony clearly believes they're not going to get hit on this. Um, I'm talking about goodwill long term, because I don't think they're going to get hit on this uh, short term in terms of I think they'll make more money doing this. But in terms sure. of the arguments that we see in Brazil or anywhere else against Xbox, Microsoft can now turn and say, hey, we're not the ones jacking up prices. <laughs> um, all right. Like we're not the ones that have an issue in Japan because we paid for an exclusive of a game that's interested for all parties and are keeping it to our system while increasing our system prices. So if you want to talk about monopoly regulator, we can. We're more than happy to open that door. But we think you might be pointing your gun in the wrong direction. And yeah. Sony did that. Now, with that Activision the deal worst pending, possible time. Yeah. It's <laughs> Sony already knows that there's no way to stop this deal. The, the Activision is going to be owned by Microsoft. The only question is, are there going to be significant material contours, uh, promises that Microsoft has to make about how they yeah. operate the company? This deal is going through. Um, I tend to think it's going through next year. I think that's more obvious now, as you see, like the UK doubling up on their on, on their reviews and things like that. Then, you know, my counterparts in other fields uh, have <laughs> suggested. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure we're looking at a quarter one uh, closing on this. Uh, and uh, yeah, Sony knows that. And, and this Which, is why I was never as hard on Sony and the Brazil stuff as other people were. Is that Sony wasn't fighting the deal so much. Sony was just highlighting the things they would like to have in the consent decree uh, if they can get them. Um, so yeah. I, I think that continues. But yeah, I, I apologize for like kind of the emotionality here. But I just think of the, the stories I have done on Sony in the last nine months. And, and they just do not care about for the players brand goodwill anymore. And that to me rings of PlayStation three dumb. And I didn't like that period. Yeah. Uh, so that's where we're it, at. It's, it's actually, uh, and I don't, well, I, it, it's actually, I think what some people were concerned about when Sean Layden was, you know, we don't know all the details obviously, but seemingly pushed out with Jim Ryan being put in his place uh, that Jim Ryan's a very different person than, uh, Sean Layden is and, and it was there was concern there for many of us who kind of study this stuff or watch this stuff all the time about what would this look like in this next generation and sadly I think over the past year we've seen that pretty clearly um, yeah. it, it's a different to your point it's a different PlayStation uh, I someone I think it was Chris Jetzer asked above he goes now did Sony make this decision or Jim Ryan and Jim Ryan is the president and CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment so uh, that he is yeah the the responsibility falls with with Ryan. I suspect pricing of your flagship product is probably a board review item, but I can't probably, probably it. Yeah. yeah. Just because of the status of it within Sony Interactive Entertainment is the PlayStation. Yeah. Um, so I I suspect that's at least a board <clears throat> blessing, if not a vote. Yep. All I have to say is the generate the next generation of gaming doesn't start until we say it does. <laughs> that's all I have to say. <laughs> What's the truth? Oh, those yeah. were good times, weren't they? All sure. right. Well, we I think we covered that enough. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll 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 pay attention to this over time and see if uh you know what the fallout if anything long term happens from this. It's interesting though. Uh, certainly didn't expect it. So, Gamescom guys. Uh, while we were taking a week off, and I know Hogan, I at least were on vacation elsewhere. Uh, Gamescom happened. I caught up with this after the fact. I wasn't around to watch this live. Um, but a uh, pretty good show, I would say. And we don't have to debate on the merits of the show itself. But uh, I kind of listed out the games here on our on our sheet. So what I wanted to talk about just briefly was anything that kind of jumped out to you guys from the Gamescom show. Biggest surprise, kind of most anticipated any game that kind of you took notice of. So like I said, I've got the whole list. It's a lot of games. Um the yeah, one... I would like to say that Gamescom, to me at least right now, is is maybe uh, my favorite show 
uh, in terms of like the opening night of Gamescom tends to get yeah. me the most stuff that I'm interested in or that I find interesting that has novel, weird things announced in it more than, you know, Summer Games Fest, more than, and well, heck, even the, the, the big developer shows at this point. I, this is one that I really like, and there's a lot of weird stuff in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A um, lot of games here. Uh, one I wanted to mention, and there's a few I want to mention, but one I wanted to mention is the, the game that's simply called Ev Everywhere. Uh, now, this was uh, a broad presentation, and they were a little ambiguous around the game <laughs> itself because it sounds like a game that they're trying to tackle several genres which is why it's called everywhere uh it says it incorporates elements of several genres and keeps players connected so i think there's like building i think there's content creation i think there's sharing i think that's one of these kind of big open experiences but the the interesting thing to me about it is this is where because we've talked about gta recently and we've talked about this guy specifically recently this is where leslie benzies went who is the former lead on grand theft auto at rockstar Okay. Uh, so he is with this developer, which is build a rocket boy games, uh, building this game called everywhere, uh, which they said we will, uh, I think they're going to eventually do a demo on PC, but we'll see a lot more of next year. So we will, uh, we'll see what this is, looks like. Are they making my game that I designed last episode? Oh, oh no, they, they no, they're in. actually making something. <laughs> now you said Benzies was the lead. I, I, just clarify this for me. I've always thought of him as like a producer person, but I might have the wrong history on this. Is he a designer? I, I don't know if designer is the right word from okay. what I understand, because it, again, speaking of ambiguity, right? It, there was some around his role, but what okay. I've heard in the past was that he was a big part of kind of the, uh, not the design of say the world, but the design of kind of character and, and kind of world building, if that makes sense. He helped. Yeah, I had him it. as like a studio head type person in my head. So yeah, yeah. overall, overall concept. And worked um, directly with the Hauser brothers, as I understood it. Sure. Okay. Makes yeah. sense. So we'll see this. I, I mean, we've seen games come and go from MMOs to other games where it's like, it's going to be this and it's going to be this and it's going to be this and it's going to be everything. Uh, and they rarely land. So, uh, especially from a developer that, uh, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. I've never heard of this developer, Build a Rocket Boy Games. Are they? You don't know about them? Dude, they're <laughs> prolific. Come on. Everybody knows about Build a Rocket Boy Games. That's is that Barb? Name. Is that specifically Barb? And if it is Barb, is that a lady's name or is that a reference to uh, insults? It's actually Barb G. You got it. You can't remember the, the <laughs> Barb, you gotta G. Forget. Barb G. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Barbie, but yeah. way more recognizable brand. Yeah, well, you don't want to trip those yeah. trademarks. Hasbro come totally. after you. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, I will say one for me that jumped out, and I think it's it's one of few awards, kind of you know the Gamescom awards and stuff. Uh, and I, it's one of the common ones talked about, but uh, is Lies of P. I was already anticipating this game, uh, a dark Blood souls like, a dark souls like <laughs> uh, is right up my alley. I like the look of it. I like the theme. Uh, so the hug. Let's talk about it. The <laughs> you, hear your you let's like hear your take. What I, my my theme is it's Bloodborne again, but no, you know I, hey, I, no, I want you, I want everybody to talk about the games that they least identify with on this episode from Games. <laughs> so let's hear Hogue's <laughs> take on Lives of Peace. It's probably Go. Lives of Peace for Hogue. I, yeah, I will tell so. you if I were sitting in an office and the whiteboard said dark, gritty Pinocchio retelling, <laughs> I I would have walked right out and said, you know what. Uh, get me a headhunter because we're going in a different direction. <laughs> I'm glad people are excited about it. Um, to me, it doesn't do anything for me at all. But you knew this when you asked me the question. Travis. Of course, of course. <laughs> I I don't know what you're talking about, uh, Your Honor. And uh... I I will say I, this is the great thing, right? If we all enjoyed the exact same games, this would be a very boring show. So yeah, no, I I can see. I saw in my timeline people really pumped for dark, gritty, violent Pinocchio. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, you know, to me, I think as a guy that doesn't necessarily love the Souls-like games, I feel like we're lousy with them. From the AAA, the Elden Rings, to the to the AA surges, to like, oh, you know, whatever. Man. I think there's, there's somebody in a shell. I think the shell is mortal. Uh, you know, like, you've got uh... like, You've got like 60 of these things if you want. Uh, yeah, there was you one log that just came on out. To, 
You should log on to IGN.com on September 7th, Hogue, if you are if you feel like we're lousy with the Souls-like games. That's all I, I got to say. I don't know what happens on September 7th, but I will keep that in mind. <laughs> I know what he's talking about. Okay. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, uh, what I will do then is pass to Hogue for a game I'm sure really kind of hit him, uh, okay. which is uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. I didn't, I didn't see this trailer. <laughs> I didn't. I, I I remember the movie from back in the day. I did of not. Course. I did not see this. I don't think anyone saw this coming. In fact, Keeley even joked that nobody saw this coming. Uh, especially because not only is this a game that's coming as you exactly, if you know Killer Clowns from Outer Space, it looks just like the movie. Uh, but it's made by the guy who now has twice been given reins to make a horror game, and no offense to him, of course, but they haven't succeeded. It's the guy who made Friday the Thirteenth. And then later made, oh my God, I'm going to blank on the second one. Travis, remind me, do you know off the top of your head, the guy, they made Friday, uh, Ilphonic, oh, Predator Hunting Grounds. That's oh. It. So the guy who led those games at Ilphonic is the one making Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And I'm thinking to myself, at what point do you sit back and say this asymmetrical multiplayer horror theme uh, is not really your bag? Um, because both of those games faltered pretty heavily. Um, so... I don't know. Yeah, but Bulls when you're up. making licensed games, the goal is to get them in the door, see if you can make a profit. And then, you know, if you do better than that, hey, do we know if Predators or, or Friday the 13th did enough to do that? Because I, I actually know enough people that really love Predator Hunting Grounds. And we know that it got pushed through PlayStation Plus. It did. So, you know, there are ways to make a living in this industry uh, on, the, <laughs> on the outskirts. This is very true. Very true. Anyway, all right. Give me a game, guys. Give me something that kind of... Uh, uh, I'm going to tell you guys something right now. I saw nothing that interested me. Like, I saw stuff that was what? like, oh, look, Dune. Yeah. MMO. And like, survival crap. Dune is fun. No? Yeah, no. No? No. no. Like, There's nothing. like a list like, of like 30 nothing, games nothing and not new. one of them. Nothing not one of them jumped that out to you. I saw that I like knew. Like, like Hogwarts, of course, was there. You know, like that kind of stuff. Homeworld 3, interested in because I've, I've loved that series, which is probably weird but it's it's i i've I loved that kind of uh game uh other than that man i mean like at the very end when they did that dead island 2 i was like who the hell was waiting for this for a long time like you know like that's what he said he said oh yeah we've been waiting this for this yeah, i don't, I don't well, know then it was announced eight years ago now so. wait a minute well, it was that's fine but yeah you know i thought at first i was like hey this is is this a new gta because i saw a guy sitting on the couch i was like is it or you know is this something i was like this is gonna be awesome and then i was so I see zombies, and I'm like, oh, another zombie game. I was like, oh, okay, here we go. Now, in some Los Angeles. GTA. GTA will be maybe. announced by I Rockstar. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. maybe. No. no. I, I mean, it was all right. You know, it was fine. <laughs> but there was nothing new that really popped out. That, you wow. Know, I mean, I've, got a, games, I've got at least 10 games, games here that I can mention. Oh, no. Did, nope. Didn't they didn't Nothing. they get out two dying lights between Dead Islands? I mean, like, isn't that how yeah. this went down? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was a fracture. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, so that's that's wild to me, Dan, because I like basically everything here I, in terms of like it, it's all interesting and weird and bizarre. The one that jumped out at me is like I, I, I really like Brandon Sanderson. I really like okay. Mistborn. Um, and so I think he's – I really like the guys that make Subnautica. Subnautica to me is is probably the best survival crafter game um, that exists. Uh, and so they're making – Travis is trying to mock me, but I think he's muted. I, I don't know. Could go – could go either way. Moon, Moonbreaker uh, is the game you're referring muted. to. I've been sneezing over here this morning. Okay. I, I don't wow. know what you were saying, Travis, but no, I yeah, and I didn't remember the name of it, but it's like the, the Moonbreaker war game with Brandon, Brandon yep. Sanderson. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Sci fi uh, digital tabletop game, they said, written by Brandon Sanderson. Yeah. What? Oh my God. I did not see that. I'm going to watch that immediately. Yep. It is on the list that should be in front of you. Yep. 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 I saw the list, but I was like, <laughs> these are just names. What am I supposed to do with this? I, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a big Brandon Sanderson fan. Um, and so that's kind of cool. I, you know, you never know, right. I don't, I don't detect any George RR R. Martin in Elden Ring, for instance. Sure, so sure. it's like, you don't know exactly what role these famous authors have with these things, yeah. uh, but it, it seemed cool. And I really do like the Subnautica team, which is, I can't remember their, I'm sorry, developers. It's something like unknown galaxies. Mm. Yeah. I Subnautica play it, <laughs> play it folks. I think it's on game pass. Um, 
I did notice, uh, I think this one kind of went by a lot of people, but the game uh, called Word Song, which is W-Y-R-D song. Uh, sure. This is developed by Wicked Games, uh, led by Jeff Gardner, uh, who's a former Bethesda lead on, um, one of the leads, of course, on uh, Fallout and Skyrim. Okay. So, um, you know, that could be very interesting. I think there was a lot of stuff like that. Like Atlas Fallen struck me as uh, very cool looking. It's an ARPG from Deck 13. So they were... Um, they're the ones who did the Surge series. Uh, and if you played Surge 1 and 2, you know that 2 built pretty heavily successfully on top of 1. Surge um, is good. So, yeah, so they've been, you know, polishing their craft, if you will. And uh, uh, I'd be interested to see how that turns out. Um, it's a lot of other games here that we'll be talking about. Um, and then Kojima, <laughs> Kojima came on to announce, and I'm sitting here thinking, okay, is he going to tease game? You know, what What do we have Kojima on here for? And he's making a podcast, apparently. So, uh, okay. He's uh, living his life. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. He got, yeah. he got a Death Stranding out. He's clearly making a Death Stranding 2 and something else for Xbox. <laughs> I mean, we don't know, right? Didn't you? No, the, no, the, we the, still don't know. We still The Walking know. Dead guy already gave up that he's working on. I mean, Stran on, uh, if, if Game Pass is any indication, he might be making Death Stranding 2 for Xbox. I mean, yeah, I cool. mean, sure. I, I suspect yeah. that Death Stranding 1's ownership by Sony is going to impact derivative works made on the Death Stranding universe, but who Probably. knows what that contract says? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they, if Sony's uh, contract uh, contracting these days is anything like the Bungie agreement, then uh, who knows what will happen with uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe he has creative freedom. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. Well, we are right at the top of the hour and our special guest is here. So we're going to go ahead, and jump off of Gamescom for now. We'll obviously talk a lot more about those games in the near future and the other kind of news items that happen. But right now, I want to welcome uh, Mark Darrow to the show who is the former executive producer at BioWare uh, and was known for uh, franchises, especially Dragon Age, Anthem, and others. Mark, good morning, man. Good yes. morning. Hey, how are you doing, Mark? Uh, well. That's it? God, you guys. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I don't know if we were, I know we're acting professionally, no? This is professional. I mean, you can be happy. Can the clap. guy's here. Clap away. Mm -hmm. Whatever. <laughs> Sure. Mark, how you doing, man? Good to have you on. I'm doing really well. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much, man. Very really been hey, looking forward. Happy to this. birthday! Yes, oh, yes, thank you. Yesterday saw, was my birthday. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Thirty-two. Yeah. Uh, yeah, eighty. <laughs> <laughs> Don't preserve eighty. Is that in game dev years. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, game dev takes it out of you. <laughs> um, but yeah, Mark, uh, so really been looking forward to having you on. Uh, it, it goes without saying this panel. Uh, so a couple things. One, we've talked very fondly about Bioware games. And, and you know, we are seasoned gaming here. We've been gaming a long time. And uh, the foundation of games like, uh, you know, Dragon Age Origins and Knights of the Old Republic and Jade Empire and all these games that Bioware was known for. Uh, have been foundationally important to us. So uh, it, it's awesome to have someone like yourself who has such a long history, not only in programming and, and creative uh, uh, directing and producing, but at Bioware itself from the 90s, which uh, we'll talk about, of course, but uh, many refer to the older Bioware games as, you know, kind of very, very special in their history of games. So uh, just thank you for taking the time and coming on to join us. Yeah, for sure. I think there's lots to talk about. Yeah, no doubt. So uh so we do have some super chats i'll get to uh people are already asking questions of you mark but uh just a little history here and please correct me anywhere where i maybe misstep here but uh you spent nearly 23 years at bioware and you began uh in the mid late 90s it was a bit more than 23 years actually um okay yeah, i started it in in 1997 and okay. left in 2021 so it was almost full, 24 but wow. not quite. okay okay I perfect. eight years old <laughs> yeah. he's the young one mark yeah. don't worry well, about him yeah when the day we hired someone in qa who was born after i started at bioware was that that was a day that made me feel very very old <laughs> <laughs> the time for reflection yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh you were the uh project director on dragon age 2 but you exec produced all three dragon ages and anthem do i have that right that's that's correct yeah Okay, perfect. And then uh, obviously before that, you were a programmer, including lead programmer on a number of titles, uh, including Baldur's Gate, Neverwinter Nights, uh, Jade Empire, and others. Uh, so I actually became a lead programmer on Baldur's Gate 2. I was just a regular okay. programmer on Baldur's Gate 1. Excellent, excellent. Uh, again, another... portfolio there, Mark. 
Ben yeah, Zabon. yeah, you, you've kind of you've done some stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, and then you left uh, you left Bioware in 2020, and uh, I actually um, have been going through your YouTube channel called Old Game Dev Advice, which, by the way, I just want to compliment you on because there's some fascinating uh, kind of topics and things that you talk about there. In fact, yesterday I was catching up on the one talking about EA, which we will talk about as well, I'm sure. Yeah, I do think so. that, um, you know, there's stuff there that's that's mainly for people who are interested in video game development, but I think there's interesting stuff for, for anybody who has any um, interaction with the game industry at all. Yeah, yeah, fair mm, enough. Absolutely. Fair enough. So I think I, I'll start, guys, and, and feel free to jump in, obviously. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask you, especially, you know, just coming from kind of the, the seasoned approach and we've been gaming a long time, is obviously the gaming industry is drastically different today uh, than it, it was even a decade ago, but never mind the 90s, right? Um, or before then. So in your opinion, or, you know, how do you look at the gaming industry today when you, you've you've helped developed some core experiences for decades uh and you've been around obviously since kind of the start uh with many of us you know back in the arcade and atari days all the way through now where we we talk a lot about live service and microtransactions and you know cross play and all these things these global kind of features i mean what's your personal opinion of where the industry has gone um and you know how do you feel about gaming in 2022 at the moment yeah, so I mean, I, I think that one thing that's happened that's pretty universal to the industry as whole is the head's gotten taller. So what I mean by that is the first couple of games in the sales charts are now dominating the overall sales. Um, and um, what that means is if you have um, the third or fourth best shooter, you might be selling one-tenth what the, the person in the number one spot is. Used to be... Actually, EA is a perfect example of this. Used to be EA dominated um, as a as a publisher of make by making the second best thing in every single uh, category across the across the entire industry. Um, that's not really that great anymore because the difference between first and second is actually so big. Live service where these games go out and maybe they're free, maybe. At, but at very least, most of their money comes from stuff that happens after they launch. Uh, it's even worse. It's even more that first is giant. Second is maybe a quarter or less of that. Third is maybe a quarter or less of that. Mm -hmm. So it's become, I, I worry that the industry, at least at the top, has become this, it's squeezing everything out. The middle, the, the thing I really worry about right now in the in the video game industry is the middle. The middle in a lot of things is unstable, um, not just the video game industry, in everything in our lives. And I think what's happening is right now is the middle's getting either squeezed up in terms of they're being forced to turn into AAA. Um, you see that with things like Obsidian, basically, is sort of being pushed sure. up into AAA, or it's being pushed down. And uh and budgets are actually going down to allow them to continue to exist in the sort of in the indie space. Um, I my hope would be that what we will see is a reemergence of AAA indie, whatever you want to call it, as as the actual AAA space essentially distills itself down to four or five games or maybe maybe a bit more than that and then this there's this void left behind that maybe some new players can move into mm. but right now i worry that we're just sort of squeezing everything up into the top that's why as well we're seeing i think so much uh um accumulation of studios by the big players mm. go ahead Hope. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, one of the things that is my bugaboo around here, and I've, they've, they've heard me complain about at, at length, <laughs> is a generalized lack of variety, especially at the top ends and the ones that are getting budgets that I miss from things like I consider it like the PlayStation 2 era. Um, do you think that that kind of top heaviness in terms of revenues and AAA versus indies and things like that is is one of the things that is a reason why we're not seeing more variety and more attempts to have that variety, especially in that even double A space? um because of that top heaviness yeah i think that's exactly right is is that what's happening is budgets are huge well over a hundred million dollars um for anything in the triple a space unless you are um able to pay 
really low salaries because of the location, uh, an anomaly location. But even yeah. even Cyberpunk, um, you know, with Polish salaries is probably well over a hundred million dollars of budget <laughs> at this point. Um, uh, so as a result, you've got a huge budget. You're you're not willing to take a significant risk on that game. So you're going for something that you understand out of the gate. And honestly, even in double A, the same thing is happening because those budgets are also going up. And there's and the, and then the, with that comes risk aversion. Um, you know, it used to be if you go back to even back to PlayStation One days, it, you're making a game for under ten million dollars, um, potentially well under ten million dollars. That's kind of a dice roll you can be willing to take if you want to try to make something that's kooky or has a weird character or yeah. uh, which is why actually, you know, when people go in back into the history of our medium and see like, you know, we used to have crazy diversity in, in some of these games in gameplay, but also in characters, in lots of stuff, because you could try it and maybe it would do well, maybe it wouldn't do well, but it wasn't a big, it wasn't a big problem. You see this, you know, when, when Bioware got bought by EA uh, I don't remember the exact number, but they were publishing north of 20 games a year. Um, I, I want to say it was north of 30 games a year. Um, now it's seven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in my head it's like three. Yeah. I no, mean, I, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to actually put a number on there, but yeah, it's the sports titles. Probably, Sims. Yeah, Sims. Probably a shooter, and then once in a while, a Bioware game comes out. Yeah. Um, yeah, or a respawn game. So, yeah, uh, respawn it, game, it seems like maybe the problem you're diagnosing is has more to do with major studios and the AAA space because I sort of, I guess I disagree with the uh, Ho quite often on the show with the premise that <laughs> our that our that our our medium is becoming less diverse and and that they're not trying new things. I think we have more games than ever coming out in this day and age, and a lot of it is weird and goofy stuff. It's just not all, you know. Maybe you're right to to say that the player bases are smaller; they they sell fewer copies. But I mean, you go and look on on one of the the console stores or the Steam page, and you'll find hundreds and hundreds of games that you know. Back in the PS1 days, there's a lot of diversity, but there weren't that many games. You know what I mean? Like they're they're compared to today, comparatively, there were just like a far fewer uh, options in the catalog. So, are you specifically identifying kind of a a triple A problem or a major studio problem like EA? Um, kind of, but I would say that the problem we have in the indie space is a discoverability problem. Yeah. So yeah. the there's a book called The Long Tail, um, which I read in the I want to say in the 90s, but I don't remember when it actually came out, um, which talks about the dream of it's going to be so amazing because what's going to happen is with everything being online and there being no cost to host, you'll you'll play a. Uh, uh, or you'll this was it was it mainly it mainly originally talked about music, but you'll listen to a, a top forty band, and then it'll start to figure out that what you actually like is this stuff out in the tail. Um, but the problem is, is that discoverability, like these discoverability algorithms, haven't really gotten very good. So yeah, there are tons of games, um, uh, uh, thousands of games on Steam, um, hundreds of thousands of games on. Uh, on the mobile platforms but the problem is is finding things you can <clears throat> if you're someone that is dedicated to go out there and find them uh it's there to be found but the problem is out in that tail with those indie things unless you manage to get a news article on kotaku or you get to you know jeff Keeley's home phone number <laughs> your game is going to sell hundreds of copies not even thousands of copies let alone a hundred thousand copies which is probably what you need to sell to survive so um and the, and i think a part of it is because the discover the discovery engines are also taking the lowest risk choice you play yeah. battlefield i'm going to recommend cod to you even though you might love some world war ii uh survival survival game i'm not even gonna i'm not even gonna recommend that to you i'm gonna recommend you right. the triple a title so yeah like we are indie is definitely where creative is coming from right now mm -hmm. but the economics of it are actually pretty bad so well, what, what, are, what are the that. services uh like like game pass and the new playstation subscription did, are those helping uh, i hope they'll help um um and i know that microsoft released data saying it's awesome for everyone 
it makes more money for the games. But everything I've heard from the actual people <laughs> who've made games that have gone on this is this is cannibalizing our our sales. Now mm -hmm. I do think out in that thin tail, it's got to help discoverability because the cost of trying you get you make some money if you were going to sell two copies and now you're on Game Pass, you get something for being on Game Pass. Um, so it it probably is helping way out in the tail. I do think we need to figure out, uh, you know, having watched Origin, um, trying to figure out its business model, um, the way that 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 uh, the game developers are paid on these platforms is often really weird and often encourages somewhat uh, not the best designs. So you, if you're paid by session days, like how many different days a person plays on a game, then that encourages you to make a game that encourages session days. Um, if you're paid by total hours played, that encourages you to make a game based that encourages more sure. hours played. Um, I, I would honestly rather see something that looked more like the way that something like Netflix works now, where, where these publishers pay to put it on there in the first place, like a fixed amount. And it's there for uh, a limited length of time. Now there are huge problems with that as well, because it means that games would come off of these platforms and disappear forever potentially. Um, so I don't, I, I, I do think they actually do help and I think it might get better, but certainly ask, ask a musician what they think about Spotify. And it's a very <laughs> complicated answer. And that's essentially what we're making is Spotify for games. Um, it's great for consumers until it starts to hollow out the industry and potentially result in less development happening. But in the short term, I think it will help um, until indie studios start shutting down unless they yeah. fix the business model. Yeah, I mean, we're still in the user acquisition phase for Game Pass. So we're, yeah. I'd also expect a bump at some point in the future. But I've said that a lot, Mark. I've said there's black magic behind these contracts and, and Xbox isn't sharing the specifics of game pass operating. Uh, and so we're depending on them to get it right or else you can hollow it out. You could kill developers. You can do all sorts yeah. of things that, that won't lead to profitability at Xbox either. I mean, I'm not saying that anything's deliberate, but we're in a very early stage for trying to figure out what those numbers are and how those ranges work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Netflix time. hasn't even figured out how to sustainably <laughs> feed their content beast. And they've right. been trying for longer. Yeah, yeah, far longer. Um, I want to touch on your, your the diversity conversation. So one of the things we talk about here too is kind of where uh, being a global market and the, and the growth you're starting to see in terms of development in other regions, which are non what we would call non traditional, right? Uh, such as maybe uh, South Korea, China, India. You know, there are a lot of development kind of uh, broadening out in those regions. You think that? Are you kind of excited about that? Do you think that helps? Um, helps with the diversity of, of game type conversation and things we have traditionally seen in games? I think it will. I think it does. Um, uh, unfortunately, it, some of these regions are also where some of the business models I don't really love came from. Sure. Um, but I do think, you know, when, when someone in China thinks about what a game is, they, what they think of is different. And so um, it just brings more voices to the table. Um, Unless and until one of these regions starts to dominate the conversation, in which case you might just end up shrinking back down into sure. a different group. And that does certainly um, uh, China's thrown a lot of money around right now. Um, yeah. So it, I could easily see it becoming China at the moment. You know, Tencent, NetEase, they're not they're not doing very much from an editorial perspective on the Western right. developers. They're being very hands-off. Um, so may maybe this is me, maybe this is mm. me just worrying, but you know, they, that's, they that's own something the to worry about. Yeah, I, I feel worry like about. it's something right. to worry about. Yeah, that's fair. They should have as small as voice as possible, in my opinion. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do get the interesting press releases from folks like Tim Sweeney at Epic saying they don't change anything. And of course, they're at 40 percent over there. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm not as worried as some of my colleagues here on this panel about that kind of thing, because I think that you still have to go try to make the money and get the investment out. Um, so mm. I think I think Tencent's going to stay pretty hands off, but we'll see. Right now, that's exactly how they're approaching it. And definitely, you know, um, 
uh, Western public companies have become so short-term focused, having some players in the space who have a longer time horizon is good. Um, it's just, you know, you, you don't, you're not independent in China. The Chinese government reserves the right to, to, uh, to, to influence what you do, but it hasn't happened yet. So totalitarianism, sweet. <laughs> well, and they shut down their industry for a period of time. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. Yeah, no, it's it, it's it's very interesting. I don't blame anybody for being concerned about that or for any other ownership. I mean, I you know, I just did a number of well, episodes yeah. on Embracer. Um, you know, people have a lot of questions about Embracer now. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, we'll see, we'll see how all that develops. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um <clears throat> so why don't we talk about uh jump over to kind of bioware uh for a little bit here? We've talked about the industry a bit. Um so you know, one of the things looking back at Bioware, as I said at the the top, Mark, is uh, I, I think it's very fair to say that a number of Bioware's titles have had a great uh, influence on uh, love of games for many people across the industry, right? And you look at those classic titles and, uh, you know, I hold games like Dragon Age Origins and Jade Empire and Knights of the Old Republic very, very high on my list of beloved games. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll just thank you directly for Dragon Age Origins because it's one of my favorite games, you know, RPGs ever. Um, Origins is fantastic. Amazing. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, when you when you find out what the ritual is to become a great warden. Oh, my God. <laughs> Nightmare fuel. Nightmare fuel, Mark. It's beautiful. Uh, so I... I you know, I look at uh, we we we've kind of talked about uh, you know you were commenting on AAA development and how that drives things and how the 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 narrowing of of that kind of scope in a way. Um, when I look at a game like Dragon Age Origins, which uh, you know now uh, behind me is what fifteen years removed. Um, Stop saying things like that. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, but, but Origins was, was yesterday. A, <laughs> that I was, was a, a freshman in college. Stop it. Just Travis, don't yeah, talk stop anymore, it. Travis. <laughs> <laughs> but what I would look at at the time when that released was that was a triple A RPG. That's what I would have categorized that, right? And I I look across the industry now to kind of your point and I say, where is my Dragon Age Origins today? And you could argue things like uh, Pillars of Eternity, maybe, maybe or, or, you know, Baldur's Gate 3 is being made as we know right now. Uh, you know, it's an early access. Um, but I, I, I don't see it landing the same way, at least for me, and maybe it's anecdotal, but... Um, you know, do you kind of uh, reflect fondly on the days of when you and, and your kind of peers could just from a triple A perspective, sit down and create a game like Dragon Age Origins? And and do you see that that's kind of uh, faded in a way? You know, is that is a lot less feasible in today's market? Um, it may be a lot less feasible. I mean, um, um, but honestly, I think what's happened with what happened with Dragon Age is that Dragon Age always had the misfortune of never being understood by EA and always being sort of pushed to chase um, a broadening. So you see this in, so, you know, Dragon Age Origins, just an RPG. By Inquisition, you're definitely into action RPG space. Sure. Uh, and you, if you actually look across the RPG space as a whole, I think that's actually kind of happened pretty much everywhere. Where there's been a push towards um, broader, um, more more accessible um, um, features and and language. I mean, there was a time when we wouldn't even say the word RPG out loud because <laughs> it was seen as uh, being too niche. Um, now, I think with yeah, like definitely that's past. People say RPG now, but um, in a lot of, I mean, honestly, in a lot of ways. The path from Baldur's Gate one to Inquisition, I think it's it's pretty evolutionary. It's very it's a series of steps towards more um, uh, uh, more action, more accessible features and bits. Um, so, I think the question is, you can't sit down and make Baldur's Gate today as a triple A game. Um, because, and it was a triple A game if such a term even existed back in, <laughs> sure. in, in the sure. 90s, um, because um, it doesn't have the market. Um, and it didn't, and, and even if the market back then, it didn't have the market for the budget you'd spend these days. Um, the industry was just so much smaller. Um, um, you could, 
Yeah, I question whether or not you could sit down and make an origins um, in terms of that hard, um, um, that um, the the some of the some of the the uh, themes in it. Also, just it's even at the time, it's actually not the most attractive game. It was already looking <laughs> three years old when the day it came out. So, as a AAA game, I think yeah, Origins snuck in under the wire, honestly, in terms of uh, of uh, um, of what it was. But in terms of scope, in terms of size, I think I think you can still do that. It's it's just you gotta maybe aim a little bit differently. Mm. Yeah, I think I think you could make a Dragon Age Origins, maybe not as a AAA, but like my answer to that would be, who cares? Like, yeah, you could definitely game. do it. Like, you could yeah. pretty much make Dragon Age Origins um, if you just went out and set out to make a game of that size and you know, basically of similar fidelity. Just let the hardware crank it up a little bit. You could probably <laughs> make that game well under these days, um, well under thirty million dollars. So you know, aim right in the middle of double A and you could, you could definitely, I think, make something that yeah. size. Now, well, that's what we see spiders doing a little bit, right? Yeah. I mean, like that's, I love Greedfall to death, but it's, yeah, it's exactly. That, Greed, yeah. Greedfall is Dragon Age writ yeah. down a little bit. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. think that's right. Is, is it's, um, uh, it, it, exactly. Like, I mean, cause certainly, you know, Witcher 3 is huge. Inquisition <laughs> is huge. Um, um, all of the, well, I mean, Bethesda is maybe a special entity, but I mean, Skyrim is hugely huge. Yeah. 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 yeah now, I am I remembering like, uh, that? Oh, sorry, Travis. Sorry. I think if you did make a Dragon Age Origins today and it wasn't a AAA game, but it was still kind of aiming for the same scope and a smaller budget, the good news is I think the people that want those games are really good at finding them. There's a lot of hogs of the world, and they know how to find those games. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? They, One you know, uh, I don't know. There's a few hogs. I, I mean, I think that's right because you saw this with Greedfall. You, like you, or you, you see it even arguably with with Baldur's Gate three, which is which is AAA adjacent. Yeah. Um, um, where you know it gets attention from people who are wanting this i mean one of the realities is is that um there aren't that many triple a rpgs or even double a rpgs because they're the most expensive genre to to make um and the longest from a content to make. Perspective, and the longest <laughs> to make so you can kind of you kind of get news by managing to exist um whereas if you're making a shooter um if you pull unreal down and make a shooter no one no one's going to pay that much attention unless you can manage to do something that's going to get you in the conversation. But yep. being an RPG that at least can stand up to five seconds of scrutiny against a triple A RPG is going to get you attention. So yep. for anyone that's I... listening, that's want if you want to, if you, if you want to make an RPG, as long as it can, as long as it can output screenshots that, that look almost triple A, you can, you can probably, <laughs> you can probably get attention. <laughs> but RPGs are super don't, don't tell either. them that Mark. Don't tell them that, Mark. I'm, I'm going to have to review a lot of games that are <laughs> screenshots put together. You know? uh, no, but I'm thinking you're, you're, you're so right there because I do I do uh -huh. follow Spiders. I do follow Larian. I do follow some of the yeah. European stuff. I like, you know, um, God, I, I forget the name, the folks that do Elix. You know, I, I, I play all these kinds of weird yeah. RPG games. Uh, Piranha Bytes. Sorry, I want to make sure I get you right. <laughs> uh, uh but yeah and, and am i remembering the history correctly here dragon age origins is made primarily with bioware independent and then ea takes it over towards the end of its development is that yeah that's right we we got bought by ea in 2008 um and origins had started development in like 2002 i mean then they had you add game. that uh then they had you add that Dr. Pepper Dragon Age armor, was it? Yeah, well, we did do, definitely did. There was there was definitely cross-promotional stuff. And also, mm -hmm. originally, Dragon Age Origins was only going to be on PC. And so, like, you know. Oh, the, sure. The console I could port. tell. I yeah, it the, 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 and I could it's, tell. Not, it's yeah. not amazing on the consoles, that's for sure. Uh, uh, but it's an amazing game. Did, did well, I, I actually thought it was DLC amazing. guy game. in the camp? I <laughs> uh, oh, uh, Shale. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the, yeah, that's actually my favorite character. But you know, <laughs> you know, it's funny as you say it was not amazing on the console. To me, it was because I was a poor kid, did not have access mm. to a PC. And I felt like I was like 
peering into a world I had never gotten to experience because I was stranded in the console world, right? For a lot right. of my life. And uh, I was like, there's something weird about this game. It's like less polished, like the controls are weird. I'm so unfamiliar <laughs> with how it does things, but I was instantly like, dude, I got to see where this goes. This is crazy. Like how, yeah. So uh, I, to me, it was great. To me, it was like all I knew. I was like, oh, so this is what it feels like to play a PC game. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought is because it is definitely a PC game on the consoles. And I guess that wasn't really a thing. You see that a lot more now with virtual. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. The only thing I knew the, about PC games on the consoles was, you know, when they tried to port like CSGO or Unreal Tournament yeah. and they were terrible on console. <laughs> and so this is like, oh, a PC, uh, you know, RPG that they're putting on on Xbox. Like, heck yeah, I can play that. So yeah, yeah, I was the same way. Uh, uh, for sure. <clears throat> let me get a few super chats in because uh, we've had a couple that have been waiting that knew you were coming on, Mark, and then a couple sure. that uh, just some thoughts. So let me read these off. Dan, I'm just going to go ahead and read these off, dude. So fat boy hard with a five pound super chat. He says, question, if you can ask it, who changed the look of Canary from origins to, uh, to, um, dragon age two, excuse me. And why he always wanted to know. So it's a couple things. So dragon age two, uh, so dragon age origins, um, doesn't really have well, it has an art direction, but basically it's, it's generic fantasy. Everything, every RPG that came out around Dragon Age Origins pretty much looks like Dragon Age Origins. So <laughs> Dragon Age 2, the, the goal was to make it look like something. And you may not like what it looks like, but it looks like something. <laughs> um, um, so, um, so it stands on its own. You can look at a screenshot of Dragon Age 2 and know that it's Dragon Age 2. I got um, The intention actually was always, as I remember, that always that... Um, the canary were going to have horns um so uh we couldn't do that in dragon age origins i can't remember why um so you know sten basically just looks like a guy um <laughs> and so we it's actually very much like like um with klingons in star trek so we kind of almost i i feel like the retcon is almost exactly the same retcon it's like yeah yeah no there are there are there's there are some canary that don't have horns um, <laughs> uh, so it was uh, i believe it was always intended um um and we were able to do it in dragon age 2 um uh, and gotcha. I, so it was partly driven from art direction but partially driven just by a desire to do that in the first place yeah interesting thank interesting. you cool awesome. uh eric, eric has an interesting question for you so this is eric game positive canadian ten dollar super chat thank you eric he says uh with mark as an executive producer how challenging is it to spend years in large-scale production big scopes inside of an ip to then jump into its uh expansion content or dlc with shorter timelines and smaller scale so in a lot of cases i'm not actually the one that leads the dlc um dlc is actually a good opportunity for you to take people who are potential leads potential and give them an opportunity to run things themselves um but the the interesting thing about dlc um from a development perspective is you've basically gotten your tools into the best state they're ever going to be in the team is running at its highest well not necessarily efficiency because they might be really tired but their highest <laughs> um um skill set they're at their highest level of skill they've ever been um so um uh, DLC is an opportunity to try things to you're, you're quick and agile often in DLC in a way that you aren't EP. But the, the truth of the matter is, is actually, typically I didn't actually lead them. I was sort of like an entire extra step away, kind of making sure that they weren't driving anything into a, into a wall, but otherwise sure. letting them explore the space largely to themselves. So it wasn't too, uh, challenging for me in particular. I think the leadership on the individual uh, DLCs might disagree because they were a lot more on their own than they would be in a, in the actual AAA development. Gotcha. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mo in the house with a $5 super chat. He says, hello, panel chat. Hello to Martha. Thank you for your part and the fantastic gaming memories and experiences you helped deliver to us. Well, thank you. So thank Amazing. you. Uh, Mo, appreciate it. And then Gia Rio in the house with the 10 euro super chat. He said, thanks for this wonderful conversation, Mr. Dar. What is your perspective on the console creator being the gatekeeper to the games on their own digital shops compared to PC distribution? That's not loaded at all. Yeah, <laughs> that's, so, a question. that's interesting because if you go, if you go, uh, so I don't know if people know this story. Way back, one of the reasons why EA is so big as it is is um, they actually reverse engineered the Sega Genesis cartridge uh, and manufactured their own. 
cartridges. They did, yes. Um, That's why they had the uh, yellow tab at the time, right? They were unique. Yep. That's right. So yeah. they didn't license with Sega uh, and therefore pay, saved a ton of money and made more money for every game they sold than mm. the other uh, developers at the time. Um, but, you know, EA was already a pretty big company, so they weren't pumping out um, uh, just whatever. Um, uh, the I think the problem on PC is you don't... This is, I think, maybe going back to discoverability being a problem is because there's there are no constraints on this or virtually none, um, there's some bad stuff there bad just you know it's badly made but also bad like this should not be this this is barely legal from the mm. perspective of uh of you know uh the content in this so i think that something that nintendo did way way back was decide that we want to ensure some base level of uh of of quality in the content on our platform and actually, you know, when I worked with Nintendo in the in the early 2000s, th there was still that that sort of floating around in their in their zeitgeist about, you know, we need to care about stuff on our platform, not looking bad for us and and being of minimum quality. You know, that keeps it seems like every year for the console manufacturers that fades a little bit as they realize that that um, uh, gamers are sophisticated enough not to blame them if there's a bad game on their platform. Uh, I guess the, my very short answer is I <laughs> believe in some degree of curation, sure. um, um, but not necessarily the the level of curation that we have on the consoles right now. I don't think it's actually good for anyone that there are 150,000 games for download on the app store. Um, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't help anybody, but I also don't think it's helpful for the industry to to slim it right down to the point where you're basically only getting on the store for your AAA publisher, which yeah. used which used to be the case on on uh, on consoles. So something in the middle, but, mid <laughs> but the middle isn't very stable. So yeah. I, I I just download all 150 thousand games. I, I I mean I worked with Mike Laidlaw. <laughs> Mike Laidlaw had literally looked at every single game in Steam. Wow. Um, like he had, like he had gone through and said, what do you want to recommend me? And would keep that, that queue empty. Um, but yeah, I mean like steam, it's like, you've got games and you've got, I've uploaded episodes of this anime. I like, it's like, <laughs> that, that's not a game and you don't own the rights to that. What is going on? Oh yes. Yeah, Owning the rights. Hmm. <laughs> Hold another I, conversation. Oh, I think we're about to get a virtual legality episode going here. No, I, I, I think this is all fantastic stuff. Absolutely, but yeah, it, it, it is a hard line to draw, and you see that Steam has basically thrown its hands up and said, "We're going to try to not curate as much as possible. It doesn't violate specifically the laws of the mm -hmm. country we're operating in." Um, and you know that has its own workability and not workability. Obviously, they've they've provided some good filters in Steam, but you have to know how they operate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, so Mark, I, I joked with you about this when I, when I first started DMing. Um, it's been a long running conversation on uh, the big cast here about Anthem. Oh, um, no. All right. Yeah. It, <laughs> we're back. We're here. We're, we're back. Uh, it has been a, a game that uh, when we first season gaming found in 2015, and it, I, I don't have to tell you, of course, that Anthem had a lot of hype behind it. And it's a game that uh, we covered broadly. I was at the producer demonstration at E3 in 2018, I think it was, at EA Play. And it's been a big topic for us for years now. Uh, and it's since then, since everything happened with Anthem, it's become, I don't want to say a running joke, but it's its become a game that we still talk about to this day. Uh, partially as a joke, partially because we loved it and we wish that it would have continued and expanded upon um, but as I told you in, uh, in DM, you know, it, it's always interesting to hear kind of inside thoughts. And I know you've talked about a lot of this before, if not all of it. Um, but when you was Anthem something that was the question I wanted to ask you was the idea for Anthem. Was that born out of uh, Bioware at its heart wanting to try something new? Or was it purely driven at looking at games like Destiny, which seems to be the, the most apt example or other games where, uh, you know, you could drive a long term 
you know, monotonized uh, monetization of this service genre? Like, how did Anthem come to fruition in its original scope and idea? Yeah, so so first thing, actually, Anthem started development well before Destiny came out. Um, okay. Um, so it so Destiny, I, I would argue, Destiny should have had a greater influence on Anthem than it did. Um, okay. Um, uh, because I think that there were people in the in the leadership of that team who refused to make any sort of um, uh, connective statement like it's you know they would they would they would um, push back on any statement like it's destiny with flying or anything like that like they would sure. and and I feel like those kinds Why? of statements can be incredibly valuable um, um, uh, but. So I've been thinking about this a lot because as we're getting close, um, I have to do the memories and lessons from Inquisition, but then the one right after that is probably going to be Anthem. So I've been thinking about like, why did this game exist in the first place? Yeah. yeah so exactly. um, the the team from Mass Three okay. um, didn't the, the leadership team at least was looking to not be on Mass Effect anymore. So they were basically um, looking to pitch something new, and this was you know led by Casey Hudson. Sure. And um, um, and there was a like Casey has a whole thing of like a pyramid of, of of process. But basically, the goal was to make something that was uh, not Mass Effect uh, that was different at the time at E3 at EA. Uh, and this is where I'm not sure of the reality. But um, at the time of EA, this is when you have, you know, um, Frank Chabot saying we will never release a game that doesn't have a live service. Right. Um, um, we, I mean, whatever, multi, whatever pro multiplayer, anti single player uh, rhetoric that was being said out loud, that was inside the company times 10. Okay. So the thing that I don't know the answer to was, I don't know if Anthem is the game that Casey or Dylan, which was the game at the time where what Casey was pitching in the early days was, um, this is a new way of telling story. It's going to be multiplayer in its conception. He had a bunch of kind of kooky um, uh, distribution models as well that that went away. But the goal was we will solve multiplayer storytelling uh, and then a bunch of other stuff. So what the thing I don't know was is whether or not this is a story that Casey crafted because it was exactly the right story for EA in that moment or if this is the game that Casey secretly always wanted to make, or mm -hmm. some sort of combination of those two things. But the reality is, is that it was exactly the right story for EA in that moment. It was, um, it was Bioware, a, a, a game that will win, win awards and get lots of positive press. And it's also going to be a, a, a live service and it'll make, and this is a time when foot was just like, like just where well, they were yep. just figuring out that the possibility of these long tail live services. Sure. Um, yeah. So the reality is, is, you know, Dylan got pitched with a, with a well-crafted story that hit the thinking of EA almost perfectly. Then, then Casey leaves in 2014. That story is so powerful that I'm trying to, to get, um, you know, Dragon Age 4 funded and the ghost of Casey's story is beating me in these pitch <laughs> meetings. Um, so I don't know. Is the, the short answer is I don't know if this is um, is is exactly it was exactly what they were trying to do. I think a lot of the sort of art direction, I think, was very much in line with what they were trying to do in terms of the the uh, and I know that the you know, the the design director was um um loves diablo so <laughs> so it is in some ways it is trying to be so it, it lines up with things that that people in senior positions like yeah um but um it's it's not the game that i would have set out to make um sure. in in 20 what i guess like 2012 um um but it was definitely the game that EA wanted to hear that we were making. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, I you, oh, go ahead. No, and I'll let you go. You're an Anthem guy. <laughs> yeah. No, I just, on, on the last, in. the last point there was interesting to me because you talked about this game, obviously uh, in terms of idea was formulated far 
before release or maybe even before most people realize, uh, including myself. And you've talked on your channel, one of your videos, you talk about this kind of hockey puck or hockey mm -hmm. puck, hockey stick, yeah. uh, you know, where, where development is kind of a, a low flat line and then obviously ramps accelerates right at the end. Right. And it feels like I, I was playing Anthem recently. Again, we talk about this all the time. But as I as I revisited that game and started fresh and, you know, going through it, it, it feels like a game that had this incredible foundation, which we always talk about. But it, it just felt like it was pieced together and nothing was fully realized. Right. There's mm -hmm. aspects of that game where it's like you had something here, but you didn't flesh it out. It's not realized. And it is that fair to say that this game, the idea and everything you just spoke to, the origination of it, kind of uh came here and then you know maybe when 2017 ish or so around that time it just kind of escalated and said we need to kind of get this I, I yeah basically when i took over the project is when that hockey stick or slightly before maybe is when that hockey stick flipped okay. um the the um so a couple things on that um one i would say different genres have different expectations of everything kind of meshing together Sure. Um, um, and this is where, so, um, so this is going to be, I don't know, me bragging about how I'm terrible, I guess. Um, <laughs> arguably there is only probably, I might be the only person in the entire video game industry who could have shipped Anthem on its timeline, but the, like, like just the, the, the nature of my relationship with the team, but just the way that I think about finaling. But the reality is, is that was a mistake. Um, you, what you actually would have been better off, what Anthem would have been better off with was someone who was incapable of shipping it on its timeline, actually failed to get it across the finish line so that, um, so that it then had to um, step back and, and maybe do some other stuff. Um, but Interesting. going back to different genres, um, RPGs are basically large collections of good enough features. Um, uh, they've got lots of things that are pretty good, and then the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Mm. In some of these other genres, looter shooters, even normal shooters, um, that central core has to be um, rock solid. And I would say, you know, combat in Anthem at launch is better than good enough, but it's not. But but better than good enough is uh, is isn't going to cut it in that space. Um, mm. The 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 not so classic, but the weird example that I would use is back on Jade Empire. Um, this was um, when um, in the early days was when um, uh, Dead or Alive came, was was out as a as a fighting game at that time, and then yeah. there was another fighting game that was a contemporary of Dead or Alive, which was called Kabuki Warriors. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Dead or Alive is, you know, an 80 some, uh, percent rated game. Um, um, but, and Kabuki Wars is a 50% rated game. So, you know, working on Jade Empire and we're playing both these games against each other and you can tell that Dead or Alive is a better game, but to, from, from inside the RPG space, it doesn't look like a 50% rated game and an 85% rated game. It looks like an 85% rated game and a, you know, 75% rated game. And I, and I'm, to a large degree, that's Anthem if, is that it's good, but good is bad in the, in that, in that, in this, in this space. Now on Anthem, this is all, this has always been a question of mine, right? I, because I was pretty harsh on a quote. I think that you gave, uh, when you're promoting the game, and it was, I think it was about the conversation system, and you said something along the lines of, uh, we're presenting RPG mechanics to people who aren't used to seeing them, something along those lines. And I remember commenting that I thought that that was a bad way for Bioware to go, because I, I look for Bioware to tell me stories. Um, and when I got into Anthem, I was really disappointed because I just didn't feel like the, whatever you want to call it, the Bioware magic or depth of storytelling <laughs> uh, was there. Did, did you all ever have any kind of uh, either reconsideration of that notion of what you were doing with Anthem as a shooter first and the storytelling mechanism later or, or with those quotes that you gave to people about having to be simpler uh, because it was going to be a different type of game? I mean, what was, the, what was the thought process there? Because that's where I was really the most disappointed because I love Bioware. Yeah, so a lot of... Um, so on, so I was the, uh, the lead producer on um, Sonic Chronicles, the Dark Brotherhood. Yeah. Um, so um, that game, 
um, didn't position itself very well. And so a lot of Bioware core bought that game and went, this is basically, this is, this is a game for kids, which of course it was. <laughs> um, um, and, you know, it's got the mechanics, but it's just not there enough. So the lesson that I learned there was to, and, and, and Casey was doing the same thing, was to try to position Anthem as accurately as possible as we could from a storytelling perspective. Um, I think we actually overdid it. Arguably, like I think there's, in, it's certainly not Bioware's best story, but there is a story in there that's okay. Um, I would describe the, it that way, yeah. <laughs> um, the, um, the, so it, there were conversations about how it had gone too far, but the reality is, is I think the way that you, if you wanted to get it up to the level of this is an, ex, this is a pretty good Bioware story, what you don't have is followers you have your you have your crew but then and you have i mean you have owen um and mm -hmm. and i and i it's kind of almost there and so you can kind of imagine maybe you could do it but um uh the lesson there was probably the lesson that we should have learned from jade empire uh during development where we actually didn't have a, a follower originally and we couldn't, and we realized we couldn't do the storytelling was just falling flat because Bioware stories are told through the characters and the character developments much le much more than through the actual story. I mean, the story, the actual story of most Bioware games is actually pretty stupid when you sit down. But so is the so is the so <laughs> I would is call the, them simple, but yeah. <laughs> but I mean, so hard. is the story of of star wars yes. you know it's like farm yeah. boy fa farm boy blows up a moon with his with his feelings like that's <laughs> yeah. stupid but it's True. great <laughs> so oh, you just destroyed it... star wars man no it's <laughs> great um, I, I, have so... a, I have a development question for life yeah. service because i reacting to something that you said about how you shipped the game and maybe you should have sh had somebody on the project who couldn't ship it so my my impression of live service and just just so you know the context here i'm the live service guy on this panel like i play a ton of that i'm super into i'm on a destiny show that i talk about destiny every week but my my kind of reaction to the live service games is that it's really not the state you ship them in that really ends up mattering a whole lot like you know destiny one shipped and i reviewed it i gave it a six out of ten i stand by that review not a great score for a triple a AAA, you know heir apparent to halo um, but, uh, the thing that, that live services get right is the follow up. And I feel like that's what killed Anthem. Cause my honest impression, like if you put destiny day one, I got up against Anthony day one, day one, Anthem's the better game on day one. Right. And so where I think they got it wrong was not this seemingly not being prepared to support their game. Like they did not have a live service team in place that was ready to just start keeping the player base engaged and pumping out new content and doing patches and that sort of stuff. And it just, there were so many long gaps between it. My personal experience was the friends that left destiny to go play Anthem. And there were a few of them uh, just saw that there was nothing really there for them. And then the support started to trail off and, and got muddied. And then their, their timeline of when they were going to ship things maybe disappeared completely. Like, all right, we're just not going to put anything out. And so it, it almost, it always seemed to me like the thing was, Bioware made a live service game and forgot the live service part, right? Like they forgot to prepare for that. What what was your impression on the inside of like was there a live service team working in parallel? Like what what happened on that end? Love so that there, question. There, there was that. a live service team. Um, it was probably a lot smaller than it should have been. Um, so a, a couple of things on that actually. Um, so one, um, your launch matters a lot um, for if you've got a box title. If, you, if it's free to play, I think you've got a lot more permission to build from nothing. Anthem, it, so Destiny has one massive advantage on its launch over Anthem, which is Destiny hadn't launched yet. Um, so so Anthem is, isn't competing. <laughs> so Destiny is competing against a concept that is coming into being. I mean, arguably Borderlands, I guess. Um, so it has kind of the space to fl flail around for a little bit. Um, yeah, Anthem doesn't get that. Anthem doesn't get that because Destiny already exists. Division already exists. Um, now you could argue that 
but destiny already exists divisions already exist so you should have known what the hell you were doing um um that but, is my argument as well uh, we might, yeah you, you got to learn from the mistakes other other developers uh, you absolutely right should yeah. the 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 one of the major problems so dragon age inquisition spent about 30 percent of its tech budget on tooling mm. um on anthem for reasons i'll never fully understand that number is way less than 10 percent hmm. um so you're going into a live service with tools that are not up to the challenge of delivering content quickly um the i mean you have to remember that a, a big part of the anthem team was uh, in austin where they where they support um star wars republic. the old republic so this is a team that while they haven't done this particular kind of live service they are familiar with live services and they're they're screaming that this needs to be happening mm -hmm. um but partly it's partly that team is getting starved to death in an effort to ship uh in the in the fiscal year um um partially the tools aren't there um, and then the other thing that really hurts Anthem in its launch, and this is going to make a bunch of people um, potentially hate uh, Dragon Age, is <laughs> so Bioware, within EA, Bioware is different than most of the other studios. Most of the other studios are essentially serial. If, and, and what I mean, and the reason why this matters is this. If you ship, I'll use examples that actually happened. If you ship Sims 4 and it falls on its face, which it did, then um, what are those people going to do? Well, they're going to fix Sims 4 because there's nothing else for them to do. Your only other choice is to fire them all. And EA has decided that it doesn't like being that company so much anymore because it makes them get on lists of worst companies in America. Um, um, if, you, if, you ship, if you ship Battlefield 4, same exact thing happened. Fell on its face. What's that team going to be doing? They're going to be fixing Battlefield because the next thing they would be working on would be also Battlefield. So step one, fix the thing you make. If you ship Andromeda um, and, and, it's, and it's not really that good at, at, at launch and needs some work, what are those people going to be doing on? Well, they're going on to Anthem. If you yep. ship Anthem and it's not really quite there, there's an entire intense amount of, of pull coming from the Dragon Age team saying, We've been starving to death since 2014. It's 2019. Where are our people? Uh, and they're pulling people and, and, and increasing the pressure on this team to slim down. Then you've got EA, who's, which is basically um, a hedge fund that has a uh, video game hobby, saying, spend less <laughs> money on this dog. Um, so, so the problem is, is what happens at most studios at EA, if they have a mistake, is there's a there's a tension that occurs. The the corporate is saying, corporate is saying spend less money, and the studio is able to say, what do you want us to do? Fire these people because then we won't be able to make the next game. And then they're kind of you reach a point of some sort. Even like Battlefront Two was able to you know it was able to spend the time and the money and try to fix it. But at yeah. uh, at Bioware, often those two forces are pointing in the same direction, saying. You know what? Let's just move them on to the next thing. So unfortunately, Bioware's very structure means that it is isn't really well structured to fix its own mistakes um, because there's a pressure or several pressures to move on to the next thing. So is that uh sounds like you're speaking almost directly to kind of the 2.0, one of the questions I was gonna have. You know, is when 2.0 was laid out and that roadmap, and I, I believe you and uh, some others commented about it being a, a smaller team mm -hmm. uh, focused on this redesign and gave us a, a very high level overview of what to expect. And obviously later found out, uh, you know, this is just not going to happen. We made the decision that, you know, this isn't going to continue. Is, is is that directly what you're speaking to in that yeah. aspect? Is that what happened there? It's, it's partially that. Uh, it, so again, it's because it's it's not that me now running Dragon Age is saying, shut that thing down, give me all the people. <laughs> sure. Um, but it is me saying, I need more people to ship this game. And um, and uh, EA saying, well, you're not allowed to spend any more money. So how are you going to do that? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, you've got this, this collection, you've got this cost center. Um, 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 and certainly it doesn't help that Anthem is completely client server 
with relatively expensive servers. And so every single month it's still running, it's costing money. Whereas Destiny, much more, uh, much more sustainable um, network model. Um, so, I mean, peer, yeah. Peer to peer, right? It's peer to peer. Yeah, it's peer to peer. I mean, it's, it's brilliant peer to peer engineering on Destiny. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't know that I want to try to replicate that at launch. I think, um, you know, it, te technically Anthem's launch is at least pretty solid. Um, to to go peer to peer, um, I I, uh, uh, I then, then, <laughs> then you might add then you might add additional stability issues on top of everything else. Yep. Well, the Destiny community still complains about the peer to peer, even though it's you know pretty pretty dang good for what it is. Yeah, I mean uh, it is it's for sure. I mean, yeah. So, a so it's, why. It, it seems so, like the problem you're diagnosing is really like stick to itiveness is difficult if your studio does multiple things, right? Because there's just, yeah. just too easy to abandon it and move on. And it, that's what I say a lot about live services. It's really not about like the product you launch on day one. It's about how gutsy is the company? How much are they willing to stand by it and develop it? Because the ones that tend to stick to it have that those success stories, even if when they launched, they had and there's examples after Destiny too. It's not just uh, Destiny. There's there's lots of examples where they just like stuck with it, mm -hmm. and it turned that corner. And uh, and I, I think that's what make makes or breaks life service games. So it just seems like Bioware is a victim of their own success. They had too many successes for EA to be willing to stick by Anthem long enough that it, that it would have probably been eventually been successful. Gotten over that just, curve. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. and and EA doesn't like sticking. I mean, if you you can even see it. With, oh, I know. You know <laughs> Even with things, something like a big, huge success for EA, Apex Legends, um, that team had other stuff to do. They didn't want to. They didn't want to support Apex Legends in in live service. They wanted to move on to Star Wars or to whatever else that that team is doing. And at the end, you ended up having to essentially construct a live service team for Apex Legends out of whole cloth. Now that happened because it was making tons of money. Yeah. Um, sure. Instant, uh, if, instant success on that. Yeah, one. if yeah. if if Anthem had had like come out and knocked Destiny off its throne, then yeah, then maybe there'd be three hundred people in Austin supporting um, su supporting Anthem in its live service, but it didn't, um, and so they so I mean EA doesn't want to spend money ever. So, you mentioned are great, you, yeah. you mentioned tools and uh, uh, beast mode in our chat asked a question, which uh, I've long seen rumored as well. So maybe you can uh, add some insight, which is about uh, having to use frostbite for Anthem. Did that play any role in? Uh, was that a decision that was kind of forced on the team? And and uh, you know, did that have any negative impact or any impact at all on on its development? Uh, so yeah, that, that that decision was basically forced upon the team. Um, but the, so people ask that question, um, and I, I feel like it's asked from a position of in a blank in, in a in a perfect world where any any option was available. Well, in a perfect world where any option was available, um, Inquisition should have probably been on Unreal, um, okay. and then and then everything should have been on Unreal going forward after that. But two things. Andromeda uses almost nothing that Inquisition made, and Anthem uses almost nothing that Andromeda made. So, so we made three games in a row that you, that that on Frostbite that pretty much started from a blank sheet of paper with Frostbite wow. every single time, which is super stupid. <laughs> um, um, but the the question is is like, okay, so what? So the only other so so was Frostbite um, forced upon Anthem? Yes. But in the world that existed at that moment, I know that there are people who were on the dev teams in the early days before I was on the team who were trying to, they were arguing for it should be on Unreal. But the reality is the political situation at EA at that time is you had two options. You use Frostbite or you write your own thing. There, there was no appetite for Unreal at that time within EA. So, so it's like, yeah, it's on Frostbite because... The other option was much worse than 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 Frostbite, which was writing your own engine. Now, yeah. so should, should Anthem have, have choice right there. No. Should Anthem have built upon what has come before it? Of course it should have. Sure. Uh, that yeah. tiny percent that you know eight percent tool spend um, is, is a lot more acceptable if you're building upon 
the tool spend of Inquisition and, and Andromeda. Sure. Um, now, very different game. There's lots of arguments why you you wouldn't do that. Um, I think those arguments are usually wrong, but there's lots of arguments <laughs> there to be made. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, Patrick Soderlund was a rising star within EA throughout the 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 2010s, and yep. um, and that political force meant Frostbite was uh, ascendant in that time period. I mean, there was, I mean, sports was resisting moving on to frostbite mm -hmm. and and they lost that fight so yeah i remember yeah. and then they marketed it yeah um, well yeah which is no one cares <laughs> no one cares no, what engine yeah. you're using consumers yeah. do not care about that yeah. stuff it's now great. wait a minute are you telling me that we shouldn't be all pumped about ubisoft's new games their own snowdrop yeah. You can be pumped about it if you're pumped about it, but don't be pumped about it because of what the engine is. Uh, <laughs> but Ubi does the same things. They put Snowdrop yeah. in their ads. I yeah. know. And don't, put, don't put it on the box art, people. That's not no, a good it's, move. Don't, it's not. No I don't know why. We keep, as an industry, we keep trying to make this happen. And I know that we, we have a, like happened in early um, Gen 3. I can't remember what generation now, but when, when Unreal 4 was every single game, um, yep. And and you know Unreal had kind of a look back then. Um, um, we we might run into in, enter into a, a, a time when Unreal Five is every single game. Um, <laughs> that is. Um, um, so then you might want a different engine just to say if if the games start looking the same, then then maybe an engine is really more a signal of will look different. But I don't think that's going to happen this time. I just think the the technology has moved along that. You're going to be able to make an Unreal game and not make it look like an Unreal game. Mm. Sure. Well, it's interesting. I always, as a business guy, as a, as a business focus guy, I always think it's, and, I, and as a Square Enix fan, I'm always looking at them trying to justify Luminous Engine and then watching Ubisoft market Snowdrop, and you get different feelings for things. I have a feeling for how Frostbite looks and the way yeah. it covers reflections and rocks and things like that. I have a way, I have a feeling for how Snowdrop looks. I have a feeling for Luminous and how it looks. And interestingly enough, I think you got it right. It's more difference than, hey, come join us, because it's like, I hate Luminous. I think right. Snowdrop's impressive for scale, and I really like how materials look in Frostbite. What does that mean for a game? Nothing. Yeah. You guys <laughs> know Snowdrop the game. might be yeah. the one that matters. The, uh, Snowdrop and Bethesda's engine, whose name I forget right now, might be the ones that maybe matter the most, because Snowdrop has been optimized for building Ubisoft games, for building... The games which are big and open and you climb oh, to the top of a yeah. tower. Um, <laughs> and um, so they're, they've been optimized for building that same sort of thing. But that's the same thing. They have a tools pipeline that is optimized for building a specific kind of game. But most of the other engines, Unreal, Frostbite, these are engines that at best were optimized to make a game that most of the games that use the engine aren't. aren't. Um, yeah. Both Unreal and Frostbite are shooter engines in their um in their dna and so when you're using them to make something that isn't a shooter you're having to do all that tooling yourself in most cases right that's why i uh i talk quite a bit about i'm a big halo guy on the panel mark and, and one of the things that really took me aback when they started talking about the development of halo infinite was that they're creating their own new engine for an open world halo um and just imagining what little i know about dev app development uh, imagine what that team went through to, to put that together and try to piece this 20 year old engine uh that bungie you know worked on and all the tool sets that go along with that into this new kind of engine and update and make it feel the same for halo players and mm -hmm. I, ca I can only imagine the processes it's a it's a very expensive thing i mean and, and engines get like you see this like um engines get rickety over time, <laughs> um, you did um, mention Bethesda's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Creation <laughs> engine, yeah. creation engine. That's right. Creation engine. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, super chat uh, from Super Seven X. Two dollars super chat. He says Chronicles is my favorite Sonic game. So thank you, Mark. That's awesome. No comment necessary. There you go. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. That's <clears> awesome. <throat> uh, <clears throat> um, so I'm going to put you on the spot for one quick question because I've been wanting to ask you this. What is your favorite Bioware game that's ever been made or that you had a hand in? Um, so that's, it's interesting because there's a lot of ways to answer that question. Um, <laughs> Travis so, tells us that all the time, yeah. Man after my own heart. So the, the, so the, from, a, from, a, from a development perspective, the team I enjoyed 
uh, the most with the Sonic game. Um, that you know, oh. there's just a power right. to to working with a smaller team who is able to you know, I wore a lot of hats on that project. There's just something to that flexibility and that uh, agility. Um, honestly, the from a from a the game that is cl the the game that is most the game we were trying to make is Inquisition. Um, yep. We were setting out to make a, a, a bigger game with more exploration and bring a lot of things back into the franchise. I think that game um, is the one that um, is most that. From as a player, you know, I don't. It's it it it's hard to uh, for at least for me. It's hard to play any of them. Honestly, yeah, I can. Um, I didn't work on Mass Two, so maybe maybe my answer is Mass Two. Okay. Um, for that reason, more beautiful, than else. You, you beautiful, <laughs> soak in it, Hog, soak in it, Ains, eat it. Yes, Mark, you have accidentally <laughs> stepped into a, a quite we funny. have our definitive answer. Mark, it was nice seeing you. Uh, yeah. we're, the we're gonna go ahead and call it yeah. an episode, everyone. We will be yeah, back next you. week. Thank but you, Mark. We uh, might be back next week. I don't know. You, I, I, I you will accept my. I will yeah. accept my comeuppance on this kind of stuff. Like, like, yeah, like I'm live streaming Dragon Age Origins right now. Yeah. With this and that's you know what is it now? It's been it's <laughs> been 13 years since I worked on that, and um, playing it now is still a weird collection of of memories and uh, and traumas resurfacing as I'm and plus seeing a game I don't really remember that well. So it's this weird. It's a weird emotional thing journey going through it because even now, I'm, I'm still remembering things randomly. So I I'm not playing that game as a player yeah. exactly. I'm playing that game as a dev, even this far out. So I, I it's hard sure. for me to for any game I worked on. It's, it's really hard for me to um, to have that kind of um, objective interaction. Sure, sure, sure. That makes sense. That's a uh... You, 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 the reason we kind of laughed when you said that, Mark, is uh, there's a long running, another long running debate in our com core community here, not only between the four of us, but other podcasts is uh, between what's the best Mass Effect. And Hogue and I and others contend that Mass Effect 1 is the best Mass Effect. And Dan and Travis and others, I would say more others to get, to be fair, contend that Mass Effect 2 is the best Mass Effect. But uh, it's a, a long running debate. We even had an entire podcast talking about it. I mean, it really depends on, I think, how you're just deciding that. Because the first one always is going to be the one that set the that set the expectation for the franchise. Mm -hmm. So um, it's getting free points for that, Mass 1. Um, execution wise, I mean, Mass 1 has a lot of flaws in terms of so i think mass 2 is a better better executed game it's definitely very um it's very much focused on its dirty dozen in space kind of vision um which so it Sounds really comes to down to yeah, yeah. If, if that's what if that's what you want which honestly from a bioware game not a bad thing to get because characters are, are what drive the stories but um so if you if they help. were yeah. If they were totally independent games uh, that had no interaction with each other, um, Mass One sets up the franchise, and so. But um, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, Travis. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, Mark. What I am saying is that I don't come to a Bioware game for hours and hours of corridor man shooting, and Mass Effect One had better world building and a better story, and I will stand by that until I die. <laughs> oh, man. oh man it's quite funny i i'm never gonna hear the end of this uh there's already comments in the <laughs> no, i love it Pog is, no. Pog has already been texted i know <laughs> so I, i'm sticking them on you so um Fantastic. so when you left uh bioware in 2020 uh obviously it's fair to say that the new dragon age right uh bioware is currently working on a new mass effect new dragon age uh was already in what, what should i call pre-production um, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, because it, it entered production um, after I left, I think, or very, very, right around when I, when I, when I left, I think it was after. Okay. So, yeah, so we, 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 yeah, so we've talked a lot right around uh, our, our fondness, and I know we're not alone, right, of, of the classic Bioware experience, and uh, you've talked a lot about what's happened in the 2010s, you know, with Anthem and through Inquisition and these things, uh, Andromeda, we didn't even touch on. Um, which is its own thing, obviously. Um, but you know, are you, 
I don't know if it's going to be fair to say or not, but I'm just going to say it. Are you, how confident are you that Bioware as a studio can kind of recapture, and that's the word I'm going to use, recapture uh, that feeling of the, the classic RPG experience with the new Dragon Age and new Mass Effect uh, that we've kind of talked about loving so much from our past? Do you think um, that... I mean, done. I think it depends on what you mean by classic RPG experience. Because, uh, but if you mean, you know, um, get back to character-driven storytelling, um, I think that I absolutely am confident of it. And and um, one of the the um, I guess good things that comes out of Anthem is it shook EA um, to to its core in terms of maybe everything doesn't need to be a live service. Okay. Um, um, like, I mean, Good. we'll talk, I'll talk about this when I, when I talk about Dragon Age 4, my, um, but like, or when I talk about Anthem, I mean, in my videos, but um, one of, so the, so Joplin, which was my original pitch for, for Dragon Age 4. Okay. Um, the, the live service was, okay, no live service. What if we just do? Uh, we'll do a game, and then and then twenty months later, I will release another game, another Dragon Age. We will just smush the development process down. Not do all this monkeying around. We'll do maybe one piece of DLC. That's it. That was the live service pitch for uh, for Joplin uh, in 2017. After Casey came back, and um, and it's like, well, we need to get people on to Anthem. One of the arguments used for that was Dragon Age needs a live service, needs to figure out a live service. And the the reality is without multiplayer, uh, some sort of ongoing multiplayer, a live service is really hard. I mean, I, I can't think of a game that's done it. I'm sure there's... Assassin's Creed. Creed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, they have Hitman the 3. I mean, they do Actually, it. Ubisoft oh. <laughs> has sort of mastered the single player live service yeah. in a weird way. Yeah. yeah. So, but it's really hard because people wander off. Um uh and they and once they've wandered off, they're not coming back. Whereas uh um with with multiplayer, you got it's stickier. And it's also get like the problem with DLC is you're in DLC attached hell. Yeah. So so um uh Sims so, 4. Sims 4, yeah, okay. Well, yes, yeah, certainly Sims 4, but Sims 4 is, it, it, its entire model is totally different from everything else. <laughs> sure. Um, I want to know what Sims 4 costs if you just buy everything. At it's all. like $2,000. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 in, it's incredible. It's <laughs> like, it, it is, I don't even think, like, you can't even model Sims 4 as DLC. You have to model it as its own entity because it, its attach rates are insanely high, <laughs> higher than even things like, like the like the destiny expansions like it's in it's in insane um it's it's a great it's amazing but it's definitely a weird special thing um yep. it's like so Minecraft. Yeah. you just gotta take it it's an outlier take it out of the equation if you're trying to yeah it yeah out. well it's the same reason why you know gta and breath of the wild are in, uh, incredibly uh incredibly big games that have virtually no influence on the industry because that because they're too big why, and too, why even try replicating yeah, it? You, yeah, you can't make GTA, you can't make yeah. Breath of the Wild. So they people look at them and go, "Wow, we'll never do that," and they end up having very little impact um, long term uh, as a result. Although I think Breath of the Wild might have. A, I love that quote, Mark. That's one of my favorite quotes we've had today. That yeah. I'm going to cut out for sure. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> I, I think I actually think the impact of Breath of the Wild is pretty clear. Yeah, the whole like climb anything mechanic is so rampant now. People yeah, so you do. Yeah. So you get the. So it it has some mechanics that were in other games, like the yeah. go anywhere that is uh, a legacy of games before Breath of the Wild, but also Breath of the Wild. But the um, the very verb driven design, where I can I have certain verbs like burn, and I can interact with anything in the world using those verbs. That is a factor of its incredibly long development cycle and, frankly, its art, art direction. The fact that I can walk up to an apple tree and hold a torch under it and get, and then get a cooked apple in in the sort of cartoony style of Breath of the Wild, sure, makes perfect sense. If I try to do that in uh, in a in a photorealistic game, 
that's going to feel really stupid. <laughs> so, and, yeah, and it only, it only that, works in like Nintendo's bubble, right? Yeah, and, it, and and I love yeah. that mechanic, and I would love to see that mechanic. You see it like like tiny little little shadows and echoes of it in the industry, but to see it to that level of pervasiveness, you either need to execute it to an incredible fidelity level so that it actually kind of makes sense that you're doing it, um, or you need to have an art style that's similar to Breath of the Wild, where you get away with it it happening. But uh, but and so yeah, that's that's fascinating. We, like we looked at for in early in early um, uh, Dragon Age Four days, we we looked at a verb driven mechanic system, and it's just like, but you just quickly realize that the fidelity requirements are is mm. impossible, basically. Well, let me. Um, so recently, Mark, I, I, I just discovered. I'm talking like two days ago. Your YouTube channel, Ain't Still Bad. I didn't realize you had one. Old game dev advice at YouTube. It's amazing. I have binged like 20 different videos. Yeah. In the description, like make sure you check it out. Check it out. It's <clears> amazing. Um, I, I saw one called "Why Are There Horses in Witcher Three and Dragon Age Inquisition." <laughs> one thing I don't even remember. No event like that. There were mounts in it. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not offended. <laughs> um, no, the the yeah. The point of that video is that um, there are features. You talk about table stakes. Table stakes. Yeah, horses right. are can you, mounts can are you a table stakes. Explain that. Yeah. And my question was like, are there some examples now in the games that you're seeing these days that good and bad um, for you personally that you see? Because I thought it was a very very interesting. Uh, take on it just just the information was very interesting yeah i do i've never even thought about it that i I think we've maybe moved past it but live service was so table stakes feature is basically a feature that players are players or executives but um in the case of mounts is players are expecting to exist they may not actually want the feature but it's essentially a signal of you tried so in the in the 2010s for fantasy RPGs, that was that was horses. Um, uh, you had to have horses. People, I didn't use the horse in Skyrim either because it's bad. And it's but, it, but Todd <laughs> Howard basically admitted that it's bad on purpose. Um, uh, and 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 arguably, Inquisitions is actually kind of bad on purpose as well. We had it so um, uh, we have different levels of feature target, and so like a an A plus feature is a feature where you're like, okay, this changed my mind about the industry forever. A feature better than than i expected b basically everyone's doing it at this quality level c feature is this feature exists mounts <laughs> on inquisition were a c feature on purpose <laughs> because they needed to exist because at the time it looked like people were making decisions about your game based upon uh, on your fantasy rpg based upon the presence or absence of horses so they don't care they care when they're making their buying decision, but when they're playing the game, they don't care. Um, and I and, don't remember horses in Inquisition. Me no, neither. You're not supposed <laughs> I, remember, to. I remember I had like some sort of dragon this thing I was cool. riding around. Like it was yeah, like there's so the so there's like there are some cool horses. Like there's a there's the bog unicorn, which is like a skeletal horse with a sword. That's the one I had. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. there there are some cool horses, but it's uh, it's it exists to exist. These days. Um, uh, so, so you still see things like, you know, I think um, uh, a, a a fully voiced um, story is mm. a is a table stakes feature for AAA. Um, I think for everyone other than Bethesda, a, a voiced protagonist probably also a table stakes feature. We'll see what happens with Starfield, where they're going back to a silent protagonist, whether or not. What the, what the truth of the matter is on them for, from a voice protagonist perspective. We've had this debate because I'm so wildly in favor of a silent protagonist to allow for range of uh, options and dialogue. It, it, it definitely, t- I mean, there's, it's a, it's a definite trade-off because uh, if you have a silent protagonist, it gives you way more options for uh, what you can say, what you can say. It actually gives you a, a, a safety valve in terms of writing, because if you need to write your way out of a problem late in the day, you can write protagonist lines and they're they're virtually free from a localization perspective, whereas with a voice protagonist, um, protagonist lines are the most expensive lines you have because you probably have at least two uh, voices, if sure. not more. Um, um, but 
the consequence of, of a silent protagonist is, is it, it it makes your cinematic presentation way worse. Um, you just it, yep. you you can make good cinematics, um, but uh, most of the time you can't jump through the hoops in order to do that. So you'll, what you end up with, and you see this in you see this in Dragon Age Origins. There are some amazing cutscenes in Dragon Age Origins, and there are some. Pfft, not so great cutscenes in Dragon Age Origins <laughs> because sometimes the the player character is just standing there like a doof, um, yeah, with blood all waiting, over him, with blood all over, waiting for the for the cutscene <laughs> to end. Uh, and sometimes they they've they've written around that and made it so that it's really good. You can't write around yeah. it every single time. It it also so, uh, makes your character kind of not a character when when. But that's actually a positive for a lot of people. You think is so? It, 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 for some people, because it, it's a tabula rasa. It lets me inject myself into the the the, the character more fully. So yeah, um, I, I I am. For for Bioware, I think the 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 voice protagonist is is a, is forever because I think it's become too much about cinematic presentation. But I'm not like I'm kind of on the fence on it as a feature overall because, like a, as you said, it's it 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 puts more stuff on the table. It, yeah. it, it takes you more breath. Yeah. I think you have more breadth. I mean, you talk about origins and you have you know the seven answers that you can give, and maybe three are different tones of the same one. It doesn't maybe necessarily matter. But I feel like I'm role playing more than when I pick a slide on one of the uh, circle conversation wheels, and Jennifer Hale says it however she likes. Yeah, well, I mean that's 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 right, and and honestly, the choices you have to limit the choices because what we also found is yeah, that um, if you, you if you write the whole line out, right, uh, and, and then the person just reads that sentence out, that is super awful <laughs> that is not great that is not great no i don't disagree with that you, you wind up with the opposite problem which is like oh i didn't actually mean for that to come out so damn hateful yeah uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah no but you're absolutely. but but actually the what you said of like maybe three of them are just different different tones of the same thing that's yeah. totally true it's actually probably most of the cases you get six options there really are only two options um, but uh, it's harder to tell because you're not listening to the to the character say it out loud and and picking up on the emotion, and then it leads to the same place. It's harder to tell. So it 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 is definitely um, it is a feature that uh, has its yeah it's 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 got its positives and negatives. Um, sure. And definitely, if you're if you're looking to do the cheaper thing. Sound protagonist is definitely the cheaper one. <laughs> it's funny because uh, along those lines, uh, and Elu mentioned this in the chat. I've had this conversation many times between Skyrim and Witcher Three. Is that uh, Skyrim? You know, you're you're create your own character, and you're generally a nondescript character. Whereas in Witcher Three, you're obviously Geralt, and Geralt, even being based on books, is even more defined. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me personally, I prefer Witcher Three, but I think it's because. I like Geralt as a character, and that obviously plays a factor. Whereas a lot of games, I like creating my character and, and role-playing to Hoag's point. It depends how much I like the character that's written for me in yes. an RPG. Yeah. Well. That, Witcher's, right. Witcher's greatest asset and greatest weakness is Geralt. You're right. Uh, um, You're right. So, like, you, Because I think for a lot of players, especially people who are not super familiar with RPGs, playing someone established is it's easier it's they understand what's going on it's just easier for them to get into it as opposed to i mean there are people in skyrim who get literally you'd finish the tutorial which is both the most boring five minutes of gameplay <laughs> followed by one of the best tutorials of the game in in games yeah. and then you get out and you leave the thing and that guy and, and the guy that you escape with is like you got to make a choice between the um the the, the the mountain racists and the and the the uh, the imperial uh, yeah. dictators. I don't know. They're both bad guys. They're both, <laughs> yeah. They both are terrible. There are people that literally that's it. They reach that point. They don't understand who they are yet, and they're asked to make a choice that does not matter at all at that mm. moment. And they and they nope out because they're like, I don't know mm. what the heck is going on. Yeah, I think Ains lives near the mountain racists. Actually, I think that's where his. I think that's his geological. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Kansas. So, There's no mountains here. Uh, I do oh, think okay, it is very dependent it. upon your um, yeah. your game, um, whether or not it it makes sense or not. But yeah, like I'm not a big Geralt fan. I get why he's. I just don't know really? that I. I so so okay. I have a very complicated back history with C CD Project because CD Project's relationship with Bioware has been please me me messy. 
<laughs> um, Expound I, upon this. This is interesting. Well, if you go back to Witcher, Witcher Two, they said some things in the press that I would say that as a professional game, as a professional game developer, they 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 shouldn't have. They basically like they shat on us for for no particular reason. Um, but also way back, way back in the in the past, when when I was you know a lead programmer on Baldur's Gate Two, I got an email from these people that were they they had they were the they were porting. Um, uh, Baldur's Gate One to Polish, um, mm. and uh, they just wanted to know how the font worked. Um, th- w- I had never heard of these people. This, that was CD Projekt. Um, so it's 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 weird. But for me, Geralt is Geralt makes sense, but Geralt is an a hole, and he's <laughs> an a hole because everyone else hates him. But it doesn't Good. make me necessarily want to play him. Gotcha. Mm. Um, interesting okay. yeah I, I think it sort of just depends on the game like some you like you you want it to be a certain character but there's room for both that's kind yeah. of the beauty right you can have yeah. dragon and Dorgens, you can have yeah. Geralt but, and i mean Dorgen. witcher 3 is it's a, a it's a an amazingly well-crafted game yeah i agree and you get to be Great. mean the whole game <laughs> well yeah. you, love you it. know love as it. we as we were talking about that too, uh travis uh i was thinking of the from software games of course where you are a very deep character creator um Mm -hmm. and uh there's a lot of different varying storylines especially if you look at something like elden ring but your your character doesn't really speak you know you're you're nondescript still um that's uh that's that was not on their table stakes list of features (laughs) but i mean like like having a character like one of one of mass effects like source of its of its longevity is shepherd and one of Mm -hmm. the problems that andromeda had was it's not Shepard. Right. And it's true. Yeah, yeah. It's might be why I like Andromeda more than most. I <laughs> yeah, I mean, because like, I don't really connect with Shepard. Huh. Well, I mean, what, what, I, he has I, I, what I would argue is that Shepard is an action, is a 90s action hero built by people who watched movies in the 90s. And Andromeda, it, Travis, or no, sorry, I was going to call him Travis Ellers. That's not his name. That's what I tried to get him to call him that. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, what the heck is his name? Uh, Whatever his name is, um, he is an action hero <laughs> from the writer. Yeah, that's right. yeah. yeah. Uh, he is an action hero from the two thousands, uh, built by people who watch movies in the two thousands. Um, and so they and, watched worse movies and got a worse character. Is that the? I, I, I mean, there's so like Sh- Shepard is Shepard is stoic. Doesn't he's just stoic uh, competence porn. Um, and, um, and, uh, writer is, is more emotionally complicated, more emotionally damaged, um, more uncertain. And the problem with that is that for, for a lot of people, do you really want to play guy who's not sure he wants to be here? Um, (laughs) that's maybe like, like. He's a, he's a, I mean, I provided this feedback during the development. It's, it's, it's younger. It's a younger, it's, it's skewing way younger. He skews as a hero from a CW show. Um, <laughs> and, but, <laughs> but that was on purpose. Sure. They yeah. were trying for a younger, and, and I think there are, there's an audience who like it better because they can identify with that. And they're like, yeah, if I was in this situation, this is how I'd feel. Yeah. Whereas Shepard's just like, just gotta go to work like he's <laughs> so he's from the movies that i watched just gets it done right yeah, yeah. well uh, hogue you're you're no no i'm gonna affi- I, your not, affinity no, for uh, cw hey guys, shows is CW's actually here. hogue's favorite channel so it's right sure. so yeah. i i do like andromeda about as much as i like one but again i've characterized this <laughs> as i like both mass effect one and andromeda because they feel more like star trek they're about exploration they're about science they're about discovery and by the time you're in Mass Effect 2 and 3, you're in dire, grim, dark right. death world. And yeah. I didn't want to explore the nightclubs of the asteroid or murder <laughs> people in the commando missions. Uh, and so I, I prefer one in Andromeda. But I mean, I, like Casey's favorite game is Star Control. Um, and Classic. Star Control 2. And, uh, Star Control and, 2 is the best game ever made. And Mass, okay. Mass Effect 1 okay. is okay. definitely trying to be Star Control. And, um, and so, like... It, it it you know it comes through somewhat um so yeah if that's what you're looking for you definitely don't get that in in by three you're just on a i mean mass effect the mass effect trilogy holds 
scrutiny pretty well if you just kind of stick it together and pretend like it's one game <laughs> because it's like mass effect one is like you you're exploring and then mass effect two is where the where the pivot happens like that's where the the, the setback happens and then mass three is just that rocket luge to the to the end <laughs> um uh so where it's so it's, it's kind of like watching the last hobbit movie you know, like this is the ending to the last movie i just watched like it's <laughs> Uh, Mass Three kind of is the ending to the other two games, the whole the whole game, which I think is you know one of the reasons why it gets the criticisms that it does, is because it's um, the game itself is the, it, if you tr it, like the ending isn't the bit at the end. The ending is it starts at the very first second of the game. It's all ending. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, and I think the biggest problem it has there is it's still its own game, right? So yeah. you still are doing side quests. You're still getting champagne from yeah. random moons while that's the, the apocalypse is happening. Yeah, <laughs> that which is always a problem of any sort of – if you put the stakes too high, you're going to – your pacing is you, – you, you better be prepared for your right. pacing to either feel really weird or to mm. have to make a very short game. But that champagne helped me get war assets, guys. You don't understand. Right. <laughs> Speaking of, right, war assets yeah. and, and yeah. things like yeah. that. And also playing a lot of the multiplayer was, was yep. very helpful. Yep. Um, one question I was asked in chat, I'm jumping around here, but I, I did want to ask you while I have you, Mark, uh, going way back now to Jade Empire, uh, generally beloved game. I know it's one of my favorites. That's my original copy that I got uh, You know, at the time. Um, why... Was do you know a reason or why did we never see a follow up to that? It just kind of came out as a standalone kind of classic. Again, the word it, classic Bioware experience. People loved it. It reviewed well and it just disappeared. It didn't sell very well. Um, okay. uh, I, um, That'll do so it, it yeah. wasn't Mar it was so so it was uh, so at the time it was Microsoft exclusive. Um, uh, it was yep. uh, Microsoft seemed to have sort of it central advertising, which is uh, the the best named. Group. It sounds like where the where the wet work guys come from. <laughs> Central advertising. Um, uh, it wasn't marketed very well, uh, but it also, you know, it's a bit of a niche concept. It was yeah. it was conceived of kind of coming off of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, doing super big in um, North America, which was a lot earlier than that game came out. Um, I can't remember when exactly it came out, but years. Uh, so it missed. It missed its window of potentially to have done much larger. Um, so then, you know, when, then then so it, there was other things. So there was a sequel in development because um, oh. uh, I started as lead programmer on that, went on to Sonic, came back to actually take over as uh, the executive producer on that game, ended up being the one that shut it down. So the reason mm -hmm. it got shut down is because um, uh, EA, we had been acquired by EA. They didn't want to spend any more money. Um, Mass Effect, both Mass Effect 1 and um, uh, Dragon Age Origins needed more people. Uh, EA basically said, you, you, you got you, know, you got the money you're going to get. So goes back to the, other, the, the earlier conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt and all these. So we, so, uh, so it, so um, Jade had pivoted to Unreal at this point. So all those people, pretty much almost all of them, except for, you know, the leadership who went on to Dragon Age. Um, went on to Mass Effect to ship Mass mm. Effect, uh, and when you actually look back into sort of Bioware's history, what you actually see is most of the games um, that did really well did really well by getting bigger and and going later. Um, so uh, Mass Effect was very late, uh, but also. And in its in its late stage, added a bunch of people to it. It's just that before the acquisition, Bioware was adding people by hiring people um, and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, and then after the acquisition, it can no longer do that. So the games that come out right after the acquisition, um, uh, there's a there's a bit of cannibalism that happened there, where a bunch of projects, the 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 handheld group got got consumed. Uh, Revolver, which was the which was the Jade Empire sequel, got consumed. Agent, which was the uh, mm. which was a game uh, as well, got consumed. Everything just got eaten to shore up uh, um, uh, Dragon Age and Mass Effect. And so then, when you look after that point, um, well, there was no more cannibalism to be done. There was no more. It was harder to slip 
because you couldn't slip. It became almost impossible to slip a year because of fiscal boundaries. Sure. You could slip three months, six months, maybe nine months, but it became really hard to slip more. So constraints became a lot tighter. And I, I, I do wonder if the, the golden age of Bioware isn't, didn't predicate on basically just spending whatever it took to, mm. to, to make it, to make it go. Very interesting. Yeah. It's uh it's one of those games, Jade Empire, that comes up in conversation from time to time. And, and anytime it comes up in conversation, at least with me, it's a, you know, positive reflection, right. On, on the fun of that game. One thing I would say as well is these days I would sit, say that I don't think that you would want to do a game like Jade Empire in a Western studio. Um, I think you would want to do it in now EA has, I think you could do lead in Edmonton built in Shanghai. Um, 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 but I think you would have to be, I mean, it got yellow face criticism at the time. Yeah. And I think that, um, I think there is legitimacy to that criticism. And I think that criticism would be a lot louder today. Sure. Um, so I think you would have to think about that. If you're going to do it, you'd have to think, is there a way that we can make this, um, a Chinese development, um, but with oversight from, um, from people who can make it feel like the original, um, Oh, we're definitely seeing that today, right? We saw that with Sucker Punch and, and Tsushima. I was gonna say Ghost yeah. of Tsushima, yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, uh, so, I will. Will there ever be? I, I don't think there will ever be a sequel because I think um, EA sits on so much IP; it's ridiculous, <laughs> yes. don't they? Yeah. <laughs> wow, guys. But you know, Mark. I, I was looking through your uh, your, uh, your channel. You, you, you have a list of games that you've worked on, right? But you also kind of say that were released. Are there any games out there that maybe, you know, that you can talk about, I guess, that weren't released that you worked on? Like any kind of little yeah. surprises? Yeah, so, I mean, Revolver, like that? that. so that's, uh, uh, I actually did a did a, a, a video on it. But, uh, so Revolver started as J2, turned into Jade Modern. Um, um, I, I think it was actually getting into some interesting space when it finally got canceled. Um, right before I left the handheld group to go on to Revolver, um, we started working on Mass Effect Corsair, which would have been um, uh, a, like you would have basically flown around in a ship and it would have been something, some sort of trading slash space combat game. Um, but the reality mm -hmm. on that one is the economics of DS development, uh, unless you were, unless you had, <laughs> Unless your name started with Nintendo and ended with Doe, <laughs> were really bad. Uh, so there wasn't, um, and then also it was impossible to get EA to give it more than a, a sales target of twenty thousand units. So that one was um, that one unfortunately had to die. Um, I think that game would have been great, but you know it was very early days. Um, I actually had a there was a period of time where it seemed like I ended up having to cancel almost everything, uh, everything I was working on. So on um, uh, Blackfoot was a the code name for a the first game on Frostbite at Bioware. It was a Dragon Age multiplayer uh, game that ended up just getting eaten by Inquisition uh, wow. when Inquisition kicked off. Um, yeah, so I guess I didn't kill Agent. So I didn't have to kill Agent. I killed almost everything else that got canceled. It's got to be disheartening. Uh, yeah, man. I can only imagine what that, that feels like uh, to spend months or even years on a project that you just have to say goodbye to. It, it's hard, mm -hmm. and I mean, it, and you get a sunk, you can get into a sunk cost fallacy where it's just sure. like, well, but um, in in the case of in the case of of uh, Corsair, that was probably that was never going to fly. EA was not behind it at all. The economics at, at, for the DS were tough. Um, so that one was just probably obvious. Revolver died for it died on its best day. It literally had a gameplay review the day before I called everyone in to cancel it. And mm -hmm. um, that one is that one I think could have done really well. I think it could have, um, uh, yeah. But yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, guys, we uh, we have been talking for a while. Mark has been very generous with his time today. Um, anything else you want to uh, uh, talk to Mark about before we uh, we let him get out of here? 
I mean, we'll keep him forever if you leave it that open ended. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, I'm also thankful for the time. Absolutely, I yeah. love the business side of things. I, I would, I would pick business side points for the rest of the. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, interesting because, uh, like, at yeah. as an executive producer uh, at EA, you, I'm, the job is a very like the the job executive producer is is very poorly defined. But for me, it's a it was a combination of creative and production and business. So I have a very broad uh, swath of uh, of opinions on things. I love it. No, oh, it's yeah, awesome. incredibly insightful. Um, I love these conversations. Uh, we talk all the time here, the four of us, about these are the types of conversations that groups like us should be having, right, to really understand the gaming industry and how things work and uh, kind of uh, go into more detail about things like that. So I just want to... All the thanks in the world for coming on today. I hope uh, I hope you had a good time hanging out with us. Yeah, and um, yeah. I would, uh, yeah. yeah. We if you got nothing going on Sunday mornings at ten a.m., feel free to just jump in whenever. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say we'll keep you on the on the reserve, the, the and if you want to join us again, we would. I mean, I love this kind of insight. I yeah. love this kind of you know behind the scenes stuff. And check out his YouTube channel, guys, because it is this kind of thing. Uh, it, it's it's so interesting you know you see these documentaries even like on uh like raising kratos and stuff like that from the god of war and what no uh, clip. Th this no is clip this on. is so much more in depth like it, it, and just it's very consumable like just you know pieces of uh, information you know they're like you know 10 to 15 minute videos and it's it's just amazing i've been doing that's all i've been doing since friday so it's <laughs> it's, 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 it's nuts <laughs> Well, with that, uh, Mark, we will let you go. Thank you again. Okay. Uh, I will certainly be in touch. Hopefully, we can have you on again in the future. Uh, maybe we will circle back with you once we see more of the new Dragon Age, and we can get your commentary on it. And uh, yeah. you know, that'll be a fun conversation to have. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing more from that team for sure. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you again for your time. Thank you. Uh, sincerely, hope you have a good rest of the day. And uh, like I said, anyone listening uh, after the fact or watching this after the fact, his information is in the description below. Be sure to check him out on Twitter and his channel on YouTube. So thanks again. Thanks for having me. Have a good afternoon, Mark. Bye. Thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> All right. All right, guys. So. We've been going for a while. I There are a couple super chats that uh, I've been holding because they didn't relate to the conversation with Mark. So let me knock these out real quick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Gio Rio uh, with the 10 euro super chat. Sorry, Dan, I'm taking your role here. No, he said, hi, guys, off topic. What are your thoughts on DLCs long after the main game? Personally, I'm hyped up front, like deluxe editions, etc. But realizing often by time the DLC actually comes out, my interest is elsewhere. Hmm. Oh, I love them. They're yeah. like they're like little Christmas presents that I forgot I bought usually. Um, so I, I, I love them when they come late. And it's like, oh, wow, is that substantial? Is that cool? So I'm, I'm a big fan of those. Yeah. But that's because right. I like past Rick bought them for me and I'm very happy that he's so generous. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like this sort of stuff because it uh, it it it, it de, de incentivizes people to go full live service, as it were. You know, you can you can make a game survive and just come out with a, a big expansion once a year or something like that. And I think that model is still valid. A lot of people really love it, and uh, it doesn't put all of the pressure of having to come out with content like every month if you have a live service or something like that. And so it, it does. It, it's more accessible. From a budget perspective, you don't have to be a AAA studio to accomplish it, and uh, it's nice. It's nice to just play a game and be done with it, and then a year later see something new and be like, "Oh, it'd be cool to like dip my toes in there again and then play like another chunk of a game." And I just think that that model is is valuable. It doesn't have to always be oh, either it's a dead game. Dead game is the dumbest phrase that's ever been created because like you know even a masterpiece made if it if the story's over it's dead according to your you know your your logic so it's just a stupid thing to say but uh yeah i i i love uh standalone expansions and dlc i'm down with that i think I, it, uh, it depends on the game right you know you look at like cyberpunk or something like you know i'm still waiting on that and it's literally installed right now waiting for the dlc you know hopefully we'll get it soon um but but like games like like far cry where you have you know, I'm more of a, it's more of a content thing for me, I guess, because I, I, I'm not a big fan of DLC that is not part of the main game. Um, you know, it, it can go out as far as it wants to, 
But like you look at something like what they did with Far Cry Six, not a huge fan. So I, I, I'm kind of, I understand what they're doing, but I, I want more content for the main game. Like if, if they come out with uh, something that has not even the character that you're playing as, like as Danny Rojas, and you're playing as Vaz or, you know, Pagan Min or whatever his name is, yeah, yeah, that that kind of stuff. And you prefer, on how you prefer like is. Frozen Wilds for Zero Dawn, right? Yeah, something like that. Halo. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's just That's more story. Content. Wasn't that wasn't that like a year after as well? That was like a long after release. It was pretty long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Frozen yeah. Wilds. You mean? Well, they they announced Frozen it like Wilds. six months after the game came out, but then it didn't come out for a while. Yeah, so, I know because I what, reviewed the main game and the DLC, and I was like, I barely remember playing this game. <laughs> well, that that, that was going to be my comment. Is I agree with you guys. I like it. Uh, in terms of concept, my problem is what we've discussed before, which is if I put like 100 hours into a game and then move on for months or what have you, right? Getting myself mentally back into that game is tough. You have to relearn all the controls, relearn all these things. And when I play so many games, that sometimes that's hard for me. Like there, honestly, Frozen Wilds is a perfect example. I bought that on release. I still never played it. I haven't touched it. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with you? Because I, yeah, I, I think I'm the opposite of Dan on this because I, I tend to like when they do weird things. Uh, with their DLC, one of the ones that I really enjoyed was like the Immortals Phoenix Rising DLC, that one was which good. Does a, I'll give you that. Which does a yeah. puzzle Ray, DLC, Ray. does a second Ray. game, yeah. and then does like a top-down Diablo DLC. Like they they do these other different concepts. Oh, Prey! Did you oh, say Prey? Prey. Moon Crash yeah. is the best DLC ever made, dude. Prey is <laughs> that that like yeah. that is a perfect example of like a way after it came out, like breathes new life into it. Are you being sarcastic? No, no. Moon Crash is I, one of the best DLCs ever made. Moon Crash is oh, amazing, dude. Crash. That's why I was like, yeah, I was like, there are exceptions, I think. No, Moon Crash rule, unfortunately sure. led Arcane down the false Primrose path that led directly to Deathloop. But Moon Crash is fantastic. Yeah, Moon Crash. Yeah, is Moon great. Crash is amazing. So well, you talk about yeah. the the Immortals one. I mean, like, like I, I enjoyed the the one that was basically Immortals and what, what was it? There was the uh, what was it called? Hogue, you know what it's called? Not not the top-down rpg or not the top-down whatever that that stuff can go away yeah you said you but, didn't like that i got it I, but no but, but the other one that they came out with the uh so they have the where, one on olympus which is the puzzle one right and then they have the one that's eastern promises where you take the eastern Israel, promises where, was good uh yeah, asian because it was basically more of the same game right it's just a different character which is fine if it was completely separate from everything else that was all right because it was basically the you know immortals i never really got me with the story anyway but like something like Moon Crash is amazing, you know. I Moon Crash is awesome. Yeah. I, we can all agree that Moon Crash is awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're all on the same page. Yeah. Uh, and, but, oh, sorry, Dan. That, no, no, you're fine. No, you're okay. Good. Uh, Luke, a long time ago, said I didn't want to put this up uh, because I know I didn't know if Mark would just get our general sense of humor. Uh, but Luke, Xbox expansion pass, two dollar super chat, and Anthem two dollar absent from Gamescom. Why? Uh, I think we answered yeah. that with Mark, but. I will, Luke, uh, because you spent your $2 advertising budget with us here today, I will shout out that you had Seamus Blackley as your interview last week. So if you have not yet checked out Luke's episode from last week of Seamus Blackley, please do. Uh, He put that, that was a long time coming. Um, Don Lionheart with the $2 Super Chat, he says, Hogue, you should bring Mr. Dar on virtual legality to talk biz. We'll see. Hey, I, you know, I, I, I've spoken with Mr. Dar before. Um, actually, in the early days of when he was setting up his channel. Um, so we'll see. You never know. Yep. And then Don also followed up. Another $5 super chat. Thank you, Don, very much. He said, I prefer DLC to be post-game, connected to the story, but you have to finish the base game, i.e. Uh, Dragon Age Inquisition's Trespasser is the perfect DLC type for him. Good too. Finishing okay. the big games is always a is always a troubling hurdle for me to cross. Yeah, sometimes. yeah, I'm with Hogue like, on this one. I it's like, like I love the Assassin's Creed Valhalla DLCs. Like I love Ireland, but it's just because you can just go and go right. be in Ireland. Because I'm never finishing like, Valhalla ever. There's no <laughs> end to Valhalla. No, it doesn't end. That's the little known fact. It was, it was Ireland and France. Those were great. I have no interest in doing the other DLCs. I love the Ubisoft DLC size. I would buy yeah. those games at that size. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's what we're like going 15 for. hours long. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. All right. We are caught up on Super Chats. We had a fantastic conversation with 
Mark Dara, good return. Long show today. Loved it. Loved all the conversation. Great being back with you guys. Uh, I genuinely missed our show last week, even though I wasn't even home. I was traveling on Sunday. Uh, but I, I just love chatting with you guys every week and chat. You've been awesome today as well. Thank you for hanging out with us. Uh, we are going to head and close up shop here. Travis, I'll start with you, man. What's uh, what's happening in your world? Our freshly engaged, partially seasoned contributor here. I'm extremely seasoned, and I will take you all to task on that. Um, yeah, I've got I've got some content coming out this week. I, I just finished covering Gamescom. Uh, I uh, did uh, some reviews that are just finished, and I'm just waiting for them to publish that will go live next week and beyond. Um, and I'm already working on my next project. Uh, I got a preview of a game that hasn't been announced yet uh, that I'm able to play today, but I have not played it yet, so I need to work on that. And uh, yeah, it's been fun. And, uh, you know, I got my player two secured. There you go. And, uh, yeah, things are, things are looking good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm going to puke. Yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Sure. Yeah, I love yeah. you, man. So anyway, you. watch my stuff on IGN.com. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Travis, And I love you guys. I'm excited to see you every week. Awesome. And I think... You know how tra- I know Travis isn't fully seasoned is because he hasn't realized yet that he's the player too, but it'll yeah. come in. Time. That's true. <laughs> Hope. Hey, yeah. Well, we just finished an excellent episode, in my opinion, of Lawyers and Dragons yesterday. We're doing those every Saturday morning. If you're at all interested uh, in watching lawyers be directed around by a brilliant GM uh, as we figure out how to play Dungeons and Dragons, uh, we actually have, as a spoiler alert, I guess we've already advertised it. We are going on trial next week, so it'll be a very special episode of Lawyers and Dragons, so put that in your calendar. Otherwise, uh, Hangouts and Headlines will be back. Don't know what I'm talking about yet tomorrow or this week. And Virtual Legality is around because I skipped basically 14 stories last week. Uh, Whenever I go on vacation, you can bet that the industry takes note and tries to get out all of its news all at once. (laughs) That's what I would do. That's what I would do. You got to avoid the hoax criticism. Just yes. Well, maybe one day we we'll get big day. enough, but that's an actual yeah. thing. But no, I think that uh, I think that I'll probably do virtual legality catch ups. Talk a little bit about price increases. Talk a little bit about five billion dollar lawsuits that are um, a little ephemeral uh, at their baseline level and things like that. But that's what we'll be doing on the channel. Follow me at Hoag Law on YouTube or at Hoag Law on Twitter, where we're getting into college football season, folks. So if you like long threads about the Michigan Wolverine football program, man, do I have a follow for you. <laughs> oh, my. Don't unsub too quickly, all right? Give them time. Yeah. Um, hey, wait, are, are, the Haw- are the Hawkeyes coming to Ann Arbor this year? Uh, I think I yeah. was is as is at Ann Arbor this year. I believe so. Yeah. Maybe I should <laughs> By the way, we here. have uh, Mrs. Hoaglaw uh, says this was our best episode yet. Yeah. That's all the approval we need around here. Yeah, I Sorry, thought she was talking about movie. lawyers and dragons. <laughs> I think she was talking about us. All right, good. Uh, we're out there, season gaming. Uh, yeah, we too have a couple of reviews coming. Uh, I've got statue videos to do. Uh, so just pay attention to the channel and site. You know what we're up to over there. And uh, we do have our season gaming roundtable coming tomorrow for our uh, producer patrons as well. So thank you for all the support. Uh, love you guys. Appreciate uh, everything today. And uh, as always, we hope you enjoyed it and we will see you next Sunday. Until then, like and subscribe.